we have had our program on the net, but the program today is then um, first this introduction, and then we have uh, Sida with uh, Carolina and Johan coming here to discuss on how they work uh, from Sida's part of view. Um, uh, and then we'll go into Carina talking about the success factors on the, on the global market for off grid solutions. And then we'll actually have some uh, practical experiences of what the theory and the science says, uh, which this has been part of uh, some publications in, 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 um, in journals. So then we'll also hear how things have been developed uh, and done out there. And then we'll have a QA session after that to discuss, and then we'll have some coffee break where we can keep on the Q&A. Uh, and then we'll go into the <coughs> parliamentary tool for online matchmaking. Uh, we'll have a 15 minute presentation of that, uh, which means that we'll, we'll just go through how it works. Uh, and then people need to go online themselves after the seminar to, to sort of understand and, and try it out. But it's actually there is a version working out, out in the space. Um, and then 1525, we look more into how uh, things, the innovation, innovation development and so on can work through the system. We have Malmö University working with students and the next generation engineers. We have also the Swedish International Science uh, Parks, incubators and science parks, who actually then is sort of coming after the, when the research and it, it has come out and into a, into an incubator loop. And then wind water will take up all these good examples and then electricity will also take these innovations out there together with urban tech suite. And then we'll have some Q&A after that and then closing manual and, and rigs. Where are we? We have been working since September 2020 uh, through this implementation and we are now at the final stage for the final seminar and by the end of November the whole the uh, project has ended. We have had a steering group, with it, which is practically basically all the project partners, and we have had a reference group also that have been uh, following the, the project, and also some research from the Uvi University. There is one, uh, when we, we looked at the program before, um, we saw also that we have had electricity and, and um, and uh, over tech Sweden, but also, like you say, from uh, at the energy here, at the Swedish Energy Agency, we also have the network Smart Utility Sweden, which is also uh, an area, uh, an arena for for scaling up and coming out. Okay. Yeah, we continue. So this is what you know what it is about, and we uh, we have been then on these different sites. We have been in Sweden uh, doing uh, development. We have been in Lebanon, Tanzania, South Africa, Bolivia, and Cuba doing uh, uh, doing um, activities. And the whole idea here is basically to enable innovations in the wash sector to reach off-grid environments and vulnerable populations in the humanitarian crisis, but also. I would say for the off-grid buyers, um, and and we have then tested innovative sustainable solutions in collaboration with buyers and users. Um, so that is really what we we are now going to present today. So um, we have been working with local agencies. Um, we have been working with innovators. We have been working with end users and buyers. Um, and I hope you online. You're very welcome to the to the presentation here and the, and the whole uh, meeting. I uh, hope you have been able to follow us um, what everything is about here. So, of course, there are some impact and effects uh, that we have been trying out for, for the whole this project, which is then giving an impact in, in, term, in, in terms of sustainable development goals. And these are then the goals that we have been aiming at to give an impact on climate action, uh, there are people working with um, circular loops within wash, uh, where you take uh, human human uh, uh, waste into fertilizer. We have innovation in infrastructure, uh, good health, um, and renewable energy has also been. But of course, we we our main thing has been very much in the clean water and sanitation area. 
and partnerships. All right, so um, now I think I would like to welcome you. From CEDA, Carolina and Johan. I will put my Hi everyone, um, I'm Carolina, uh, as you already know, because I work. Um, I work uh, together with Iran in a unit called, and I need to read my paper, the unit for strategic partnership, um, private sector innovation and new methods um, at CEDA's headquarters here in Stockholm. Um, we uh, work uh, as a catalyzer for new actors. Um, everywhere in CEDA, everyone is working with new new partnerships, uh, new coll collaborations, but we are trying to catalyze new actors. Uh, I will talk about a little bit about the private sector. You run here. It's going to talk more about innovation. So this is the setup, and um, yeah, we will elaborate a little bit on this. Um, to work with the private sector, it's not new at CEDA. It's not a new phenomenon. Uh, CEDA has been working with the private sector since actually as far back as, as uh, the 60s or Swedish uh, Development Corporation collaborated for, for a long time in different ways and shapes. But today it's quite spelled out in our instruction. We are supposed to work with actors from the private sector. Uh, it is stated in many of the country strategies. Um, so, so we do have, <laughs> there is some, there is some attention um, in, in working with, with uh, different and, and other actors. Um, I'm not use this. Yeah, see, we're good. Yeah. Um, the definition of um, private sector collaboration is an activity aiming to engage the private sector to actively participate in reaching development results, more or less. And we see the private sector as quite broad. We include uh, multinational companies, investors, and all the way to informal micro uh, enterprises, um, entrepreneurs, uh, in, informal uh, actors in the private sector. We need to, to see the private sector as a uh, as a big as a big and diversified group. Um, we the private sector is an engine. Uh, for growth and um, for change and for development in all in all countries, um, the private sector contribute with, with knowledge and, and innovation and know-how and resources, capital and, and and much more know-how. I used to work in the private sector myself at actually uh, Tetra Laval, so it was nice to hear Alpha Laval is in, in the room, <laughs> and I used to work with with. Uh, food and agriculture specifically dairy so I, I've seen how how this is really an important and interesting mix when you meet uh, in in but it's it's all about having the same you really have to have the same the com common goals the private sector and the public sector so so the private sector really brings uh, more and, and different perspectives. Um, which is so important. Key for, for working together is um, to identify com common goals, as I said, to recognize each other's strengths and having a mutual understanding and language. I think that's, that has been one of the really most difficult things to, to speak the same language when you collaborate. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we should really, really target and work as much as we can do. Okay, Consida, uh, as, as being a, a development agency, I think we're really faced with um, a new world, a new context where we also have to adapt. The world is changing rapidly. Um, things are, are changing and it's also a journey for us to maybe see traditional uh, development cooperation in a, working in, in other ways. Maybe not only as a funder, but also as uh, as mobilizing um, 
other partners to work together. Um, a pressing issue that we talk about a lot uh, right now in terms of the private sector uh, is this funding gap. Um, there is a huge gap uh, of money that is needed to fund the SDGs, to fund Agenda 2030. Uh, it is said that the gap is amounting to 3.5 billion uh, trillions US dollars. And the um, ODA is not gonna, is not um, enough. <clears throat> so we need to direct more capital uh, flows to the to our cooperation countries. Um, and this is something that we're working with a lot right now. We're looking at on how can we create opportunities for, um, for opportunities in, in under invested markets. Uh, how can we bring investors to to these to markets and and just broaden uh, broaden this? And uh, also, we're talking about how we can leverage our funds so that this will um, increase uh, other other capital, others' capital. So we work with some mechanisms for for collaboration and and uh, funding. And I would like to just talk about three of them. You have heard some of these before. We're working with challenge funds. Um, this is a way, of course, to to um, to help entrepreneurs to to get uh, credit and investments, um, because it's difficult to get this in in markets that has a high risk and complexity. And I I know. Everyone here understands this, uh, the challenges, and and uh, this has been a very successful way of uh, supporting uh, entrepreneurs and uh, innovators in in a lot of uh, countries. Then we have, I'm not sure if you have heard about this. We have uh, developed a, a method called uh, PPDP, public-private uh, development uh, projects, uh, and it's a method where we see that work together with a, a company uh, as partners. Um, we are co-funding a project. Um, there is a third party that is implementing uh, the project, but we identify a common challenge, uh, development challenge uh, where we can meet and we meet in the sweet spot and we uh, implement something and we solve a problem. And this is being done in, in different places uh, together with Volvo in Ethiopia, Tetra Pak in, in Kenya and Bangladesh, for example, and, and uh, H&M and so on. But it's a, it's a method that is, it's been very, it's very interesting. And it's, uh, we have good results from this kind of projects. And also, we have a guarantee instrument, uh, which has a, a great success to to uh, to work with. And this is really a key way for CEDA to leverage financing. And uh, well, th this this make this helped uh, banks uh, taking risks and and uh, sharing risks and mobilizing more. Five minutes. Yeah. Okay, um, I will now show you this picture and I'm going to talk quickly about it because I have one minute. Um, no, th there is an in uh, increased awareness, a lot of uh, talk about uh, sustainable business and uh, sustainable business conduct. Uh, companies uh, working also with, has to work with human rights and there are many frameworks, uh, UN uh, global principles, there is a new uh, law in within EU, uh, HRDD, Human Rights Due Diligence, that is going to be implemented. All companies have to take responsibility for the whole supply chain. So it's a huge commitment. I mean, the, it's, the requirements are really, really high. And we have, uh, we are supporting, uh, trying to, to, to help companies to follow this because they need uh, support. It's quite uh, difficult to, to navigate in this in this new context. Okay, so I will wrap up now, so everyone can talk. 
and I, I just wanted to, I, I looked into our database and, and we have um, where in which SDGs are CETA working with the private sector. And this is the list. So uh, a lot in energy, is work, gender equality, climate action, and also SDG number one. And hopefully we can make this list much longer. Um, but uh, yeah, we have, we do have a lot of experience working in the private sector. And uh, I will now leave it to you. Thank you. Perfect. And I will do this. And I have three minutes and one slide. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, this is why we at Theta work with uh, innovation. Because if we, if we look at development, and if we look at the timeline here, if we just continue as we've done during the years, yeah, we will see some progress. We will have some development. But it's not quick and fast and good enough because we have a very ambition, ambitious goal up there, the agenda uh, 2030 and the SDGs. And in order to go from here, where we are now, up to there, it's through innovation, through systems thinking, catalytic uh, projects and uh, ideas and uh, methods. And I mean, we, we need to, to develop as an agency as well. So we are a bureaucracy, but we also need to adjust to, to, to the reality. And if we want to be uh, one of the players that, make, that really makes a difference, we need to, to change. And we do that, this through working with, uh, first internally, of course, we need to change as an agency. But we also work a lot with the partners, funding partners, so that they can innovate and so that they can uh, help us to take those and reach those goals. But also a lot on, on uh, collaboration. I think that's the main reason why I'm here today, to, to see who is on the route, who is willing to, to take this journey together with CEDA, so that we can reach and, and um, fulfill the goals that we all together uh, are responsible for. And I think that's what, that was my three minutes, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but I invite you to, to do contact CEDA, go through what we have and all the methods, the, the different kind of challenge plans that were, that were mentioned, and see where can we work together, because we need to work together. That's the message here today. But how do, how do they get in touch with you uh, to work together? How, how does it start Come on a practical level? Uh, practical level, uh, I would say an email. An email? Well, first, go through CEDA.sc and see what's there. Because we, we try to put all the calls up online. We try to put everything. Yeah, so you have calls, you have uh, continuously called out. Yes, yes, in, in various sectors, in various ways. Uh, also, we, we link. Uh, so if we work with a partner, we add what they are working on at the moment. Yeah. So we try to be as transparent as possible. Uh, and second thing, just mail, mail us. Mm. You, you have our names, uh, send a mail. Sometimes we can set up a meeting and, and from there we, we take small steps and all of a sudden we have this beautiful program together. Okay, so an individual pro company can, can email you and then you can see what you can do with that. Sure, Yeah. the, the, the most common answer would be, sorry, we can't, but look at this yeah. or maybe you yeah. find there. And but would it be, is it, and, and uh, a network of, of companies could also then be interesting to link up with some of those calls. So, sure, I mean, the are, uh, we yeah. have a set of, of regulations and laws and, and, yeah. and protocols and so on that we need to follow, follow. but uh, yeah. as we work with innovation, we always find our way to, to address. A question, John. Yeah, thank you for the, presenta uh, for the presentation. Uh, when you write innovation, uh, is it will CEDA be contributing to the development of an innovation, or it should should it also already be considered as an innovation before you start engaging in a project together with the company? Good question. First of all, we don't have a single definition of innovation. That could be good to know. So we we work broadly with the concept of innovation. Because if we have a definition, we, we, I think we, we narrow it down. But we, we work with in all stages uh, when it comes to, to um, innovation. We, we work with ideation in various ways, in various projects. 
for example, we have a, a quite big research portfolio where we try to work a lot with uh, research results and early innovation and ideation in, in uh, I think, in six countries doing this financial work. But also in a, in a later stage, uh, the challenge funds, we try to, to come up with uh, or come in with uh, funding at the right moment for the innovators and entrepreneurs. And then also in the later stage. But I think we, we, we try to more or less cover the whole chain. Okay. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Small can, I, can, I, can I have a small talk? Yeah, why you cannot answer that while Karina gets up on the stage and prepare. Uh, in the, during the presentation, you mentioned both entrepreneurs and then you mentioned uh, two pretty large companies, as example, in the PPP uh, the PPP yeah. program. <laughs> uh, when it comes to innovation, does it matter whether it's a large company? Uh, uh, to consider it to be a Swedish it's a large company. Mm -hmm. Or the small and medium sized company. It doesn't really matter when it comes to innovation. Is it directed to a certain category of companies? Uh, again, a good question. Uh, it depends on what kind of idea and, and innovation it is. Usually, working with CEDA, if you're a small uh, enterprise, it is quite hard uh, to, to find that uh, sweet spot when we, where we can work together. Usually, we have a um, organization or a structure in between. Uh, but sometimes we do. Mm. Uh, so it all depends. If but you stay think to, to the end of the. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, more questions in that. We, we need to take the questions off at the mingle, otherwise, the whole evening will be. So thank Yeah. Yes, definitely. Together with a few friends, we'd arrange, let's say, a hackathon. Uh, three and four days, 24 hours to us. Uh, you ask me to have innovative solutions with all these cross sectional things. It has to be gender and water and whatever, what is the SDG that we say? Sorry, that. it's a too long question. <laughs> yeah, please answer that at the, at the break. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a little cliffhanger. We need to go on. We need to yes. keep the schedule. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Please, Karina. Great. Okay, so I'm uh, going to be talking about success factors and the global market third off-grid solutions. Some uh, <laughs> Swedish there, but uh, I think you all understand. Yeah. So uh, before I dig into this, previously we presented other types of factors. We digged into uh, procurement rules uh, for the humanitarian sector. I'm not going to present that uh, now, but there's a paper out there. Uh, where we carried out interviews, uh, for example, with CEDA, with UNICEF, uh, and around some other people out in, in the field. So if you want to know more about how to get into the humanitarian sectors and the obstacles, then please uh, uh, go to Swatch and Grow web page where we have all our deliverables. Today, I'm going to be presenting the work that my team and I have been uh, working on this past year, actually two years, uh, but quite intensively this, uh, this year. Uh, it's part of our work understanding what can successfully lead to products and in this case what we're looking at is uh, at the market and uh, socioeconomic conditions as well as the characteristics of specific products uh, that can lead to either su success or not success and we call this a product development process um, so Two things, there's a bunch of other stuff that probably plays a role here, but we needed to focus the analysis. And so the analysis is focused on these two factors. How do products look? How should they look to respond to needs in for the poor, in, in, in basically different socioeconomic characteristics defining uh, the poor? And uh, before I move into this bottom of the pyramid, for those of you not uh, uh, familiar with it, is basically the people at the very, very bottom of the pyramid, the poorest, uh, and then the pyramid goes up to middle class and then and then the, the, the top of the pyramid, which is probably us. Um, the two questions that we looked uh, at were uh, the characteristics. What are those that are important for accelerating uptake and scaling of innovations? And the second question is, what are the socioeconomic conditions that either constrain or incentivize product development processes in context of poverty. 
What we did was we carried out four workshops together with our sister project, the Gridless Initiative, which is funded by our core fund from CEDA. And uh, we covered uh, two sectors, wash and energy. We had 48 participants globally from all regions of the world. Unfortunately, these were completely online right after the pandemic, uh, but uh, I think some of you were present and we got uh, great insights. We also did interviews with our own innovators and an additional innovator that uh, Swash and Grow was in connection and in contact with through one of the WIN platforms, uh, one of our events. We also screened the literature. We screened around 1,500 papers related to the topics to understand what has been done. Initially, the idea was to do more field work to try to find new data, but then pandemic comes and there is quite a lot of data to mine out there. So we decided to basically change. Uh, we were forced to change our uh, approach to the methods. What you see here is both uh, how we what defined our methods, but also a result of this uh, process that I just described. So this is the product development process that we defined for Swash and Grow. You have probably seen uh, similar types, or at least there's a million different types of product development processes. Some of them look very are, are, are drawn as circles. In this case, uh, what we did was to try to understand which steps are important for the context where we where we that we needed to relate to, which is a poor context, and whether there's a difference uh, between what we usually conceive as an innovation process and what's needed to. Uh, launch a product in poor context. So this is what we came up with. I won't go into all the details. You're welcome to look at this later. Essentially, the process that we suggest here comes, first of all, from the interviews with a lot of you. It, it was extremely inspiring to understand what you have gone through and how some of the steps that we are showing here are not included in regular product development processes. And second, it was extremely interesting to understand how the different steps relate to finance and regulatory either ups or downs. So what you see here is a seven step framework running through some of the classic steps in an innovation process from ideation, deployment of scaling, et cetera. Uh, and this is matched to uh, two other dimensions. Uh, in blue, you see the uh, financial, uh, financial dimension. Up there means there's a lot, down there means there's a gap. And uh, similarly, the red lines, uh, or whatever color that you see in your screen, it's the uh, uh, governance or policy dimension. Same thing here. Up means there's a lot. Down that means there's a gap. And as you can see, we see uh, there's. This is matching probably the value of debt that some of you know, where we see both lack of finance and lack of regulations when it comes to maintenance. We uh, the seven steps are uh, also capturing different types of an innovation. So the yellow bubbles are referring to the life of a product. A lot of these are very technical or physical components. Uh, sorry, the other way around. This is the process through uh, how a product gets launched and, and maintained. Um, and then you have the operations in blue. And so this was, we wanted to understand how this process applies for the poor, the bottom of the pyramid. And so who is at the bottom of the pyramid? There's 2 billion people at the bottom. That's a huge number. They can't all be the same. So we tried to segmentize this market and uh, the way we could make it sort of uh, disaggregate this huge category was to, to differentiate between humanitarian, poor and emerging. And we're not talking about countries because a country can have everything in one, in one geographic scope, but we're referring to markets, basically consumers. Uh, our results, again, go back to our initial questions. We're looking into the socioeconomic factors and the characteristics of products for the three market segments. I won't read through all of this, it's just for you to have uh, later on. But what I can, uh, what I can uh, highlight here, for example, is this first and second go hand in hand. You can see the differences between these three uh, segments, humanitarian, poor and emerging. You go to the humanitarian sector, this is essentially about emergency response. <laughs> And because it's it's uh, an emergency response, it is entirely humanitarian aid driven. So it's not like a company cannot just go in and sell. It's, it's there, there's an organization uh, previous to that that you need to that you need to, you need to penetrate and you need to get access to. If you look at the poor, this is obviously low income markets with low purchasing power. And if you look at the merging, this is a very fragmented type of markets with very large variations in in, in purchasing power. 
Now, this goes to how you define your business model. So for the humanitarian sector, there's a huge bureaucracy involved that uh, favors usually established firms with economies of scale. So as a startup, it's very difficult to be able to enter into the humanitarian field. If you go to the poor, there seems to be a uh, sort of a, an opportunity for temporary access, leasing, renting, short term type of uh, uh, arrangements. Whereas as, as income goes up, then uh, owning products is, is, is sort of more viable for, for those consumers. And then we're moving to the product characteristics. I won't either read all of this. I will just guide you, walk you through a little bit so, so that you understand the differences between. And uh, let's just take the first one as an example. Within the first step, which is a function step, there's different patterns that we identify. If you look at, at innovation, this is essentially telling you how to think about innovating depending on these segments. So to innovate for the humanitarian sector, you need to think that this is a risk averse uh, context. It's very top down uh, for developing product. And this in contrast to the poor or emerging is uh, the poor is needs driven. You need NGO assistance. But emerging, uh, there's more of a normal market dynamic, even though uh, the, the consumer is quite broad. If we look at the second step, assembly, an example here is how uh, product producing something for the different markets uh, is also quite different, particularly between the humanitarian and the foreign emerging sectors. So humanitarian, you need to follow agency specific characteristics. There's very little space, very little scope for coming up with something new that doesn't follow prescribed uh, recipes, so to speak. Uh, the poor and emerging sectors present similar traits, except uh, the poor are obviously much, much basic. And here there's an opportunity to reduce price by reducing packaging, for example, which when you go into the emerging, there's a little bit more scope for creativity in marketing uh, the product. If we look at deployment, for example, the distribution aspect, humanitarian is about getting there soon now, actually yesterday. It's very, very fast. So if you don't have uh, the, the chains, if you don't have the economies of scale, it's very difficult to enter this field. Whereas in the poor and emerging, it's it's about last mile. You might have some, but you need to, you mean you need to uh, ensure that those that are not in the city centers are still able to reach. And these populations can look very differently. Um, the difference is that, that internet plays a role in the emerging sector, whereas in the ports, that this is still quite limited. Um, maintenance, I'm getting there. Uh, so maintenance is extremely underrepresented in the literature, though what we hear from uh, interviewing you is that this is a critical step. Uh, in, in all the markets, there's a need to uh, reduce maintenance, localize maintenance, and make it basically easy. And this is not really, this is quite in contrast with a lot of the innovations that we see that are quite high tech, that require a lot of uh, understanding to, to run and to repair. Upscaling, uh, if we look at diffusion, uh, it's crucial to have early success um, uh, adoption rates in, in humanitarian sectors. If it doesn't work today, it's not, I mean, if it doesn't work early, it's going to be difficult to get it to work later. Uh, when it comes to the poor, there's it's a, there's a lot of uh, dependency on directed policies, and in emerging context, uh, there needs to be some sort of tailored marketing and being aware that there's a huge institu institutional weakness in, in both of these uh, two. And then the last step, which is also completely, is, is the two last steps. They're also both quite underrepresented in the literature. Uh, this is only, for example, um, being able to recycle. It's not really accounted for in the humanitarian sector, whereas the poor and emerging is, is, is still quite informal, even though in countries like Sweden, that's a business. There's a business area for recycling. that That's not there yet in some of these countries. And when it comes to transfer, that has almost no space, not in my slide nor in the literature, but uh, basically it's uh, it's not there. Uh, there's no... There's no there's, Except for the discussions that we've had with you, which is what you find here, there's nothing in the literature about how you move from project to a company or from pilot to upscaling something in in in, in the field. So this is a huge research gap. Uh, very quickly, the key takeaways: uh, our product develop our Swash and Grow's product development process builds on your inputs, on stakeholder inputs, and so we are confident that it 
shows a little bit more of a realistic picture of how the process of innovating and upscaling can uh, work in poor contexts. We identify multi-dimensions that not only go from one step to the other or tells you that there's a value of death, but why is this value of death happening and what, where do regulatory and financial uh, constraints uh, take place, where in that chain. Uh, it accounts for socioeconomic difference between the poor. So the poor is not just two billion people, there's huge differences between them that need to be accounted for when designing products. And we also identify a lot of gaps in the literature that are worth following up upon. Maintenance and transfer are two crucial steps that are, are not well studied, they're not well understood, and they're underfunded. We also need an improved market understanding at the BOP. Initially, this was our, our starting point. Humanitarian, it is different, it's short term or long term. The poor can be rural, can be urban, can be informal. And emerging can be stable and volatile. And all of these things make uh, play a role for the type of products or needs that you have. So implications for WASH. As you can see in the table below, access to water, energy and sanitation is a matter of income. The more income, the more access. It's very simple. There's a disconnect between innovation and users' needs and wants, and we've known this for a while, but it continues to be so. And uh, specifically what we see is that a lot of the innovations are too techy. And just to keep in mind for all of you innovators here that it's easier to start simple than the technify a product later on. Uh, what, what our literature review shows and, and, and the analysis shows is, is that there is a huge importance of post-deployment strategies. So when financing, whomever is funding uh, uh, something here, think about post-deployment. It's not just to bring the gadget and then hope that things will happen. The post-deployment strategies for most companies seem to, to fail. And uh, yeah, lastly, our analysis uh, indicates the need for simple, low-cost, end-to-end solutions that have a localization strategy including close, possibly post employment uh, phase. This is it from us. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Karina. That was a little bit of the... Now we'll go into experiences and see. So please, uh, Otto T and Tord, you could come up here. Uh, so we'll just hear a little bit on the experience uh, from off-grid test beds, actually, and we'll... Uh, there will be three questions asked in this. One is, what is your innovation about and how can it help address needs in humanitarian or development context? Question two, what challenges have you faced when trying to move from one stage to the other in the Product Development Act process? And question three, what would help your innovation to reach full market entry in a humanitarian development context? So this is your Questions. So we'll listen to first. Okay. Uh, A to T uh, and Sunny in six minutes. Uh, Sunny Sunny is our um, product or our system, as we call it, uh, and it it has two main focuses, two main goals. That's saving lives by eliminating disease causing bacteria in wastewater and recycling of valuable nutrients to urban land. That's the two, two main goals we have. Uh, and we do that with uh, a system that we, as I said, called SNSE. And it is a modular, scalable treatment system for wastewater. And when I talk about wastewater, I can, uh, it can be toilet waste, it can be uh, sludge from an already existing uh, treatment plant. Um, we are treating that with a, a very, very uh, low energy uh, technique. And we are not using any chemicals. We are only using a special developed aerator. Um, we can design this system for pure latrine, uh, black water, or sludge, or a mix of those. 
Um, we can scale it to. Well, it's an economical question, actually. Uh, but uh, from thousands, thousand people and upwards, it would be more and more economical. Um, we can very easily adapt it to local conditions. Uh, and the outcome of the system is a fully sanitized liquid with all the uh, valuable nutrients uh, preserved. And that is a liquid like, like coffee or Coca-Cola. It's the same. <laughs> Um, and we call that as a biofertilizer, ready for use on the terrible land. And those um, nutrients, they can replace nowadays very expensive uh, import mineral fertilizer. And the arrow you pick. <laughs> we have already in Sweden two existing uh, plants. The one has been running from 1998. The other is running, has been running from 2012. And we have had all full access to those during our development uh, phase. What we have been uh, doing is we have um, further developed the uh, the aeration technique to make it more efficient and more energy saving. Um, so. We started with our stock was very easy because we already had an order from a paying customer. And that solved a lot of our development costs, of course. Okay. Um, we have been, uh, we have a, a, a pilot running in Bolivia since 2019. Uh, and uh, our challenges in the international market is that this system always become a, a, a part of the infrastructure, which includes a lot of political decisions. So we have very, very long lead times. We have also seen corruption risks and financial issues. Question number three was what would happen? What we have discovered is what and what we cannot detect, of course, is a change of view of value human life. That would be a very good help. And also uh, the value of the natural resources. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that's another workshop. Um, what helped us in, in Bolivia was a very, very good contact with the Swedish Embassy, sorting out all local conditions, regulations, in um, important contacts, and financing. Um, contacts with local politicians and his decision makers. Uh, we found a re reliable local partner, in this case, the customer, uh, taking care of the building process and so on. And um, the number four, um, development countries are depending on economic aid. And we have not found any country so far 
that is willing to take the investment cost. Your summary, summary was uh, summary was very very good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Maria, please come up. And uh, do you have the remote there, or? Can you be my sidekick, please? Yes, please. Oh, yes, of course. Have ready to be to the blocking room. <laughs> Already, you know, you flushed water, and and you probably washed your hands, and we take that for granted that we have water. Uh, I work for a company called Corex of Sweden, and we have invention nature, or actually nature was already invented, but we have uh, found a way of uh, cleaning wastewater and reuse it. Also in Sweden, we have areas where the water is running out, the groundwater is, so you cannot water your lawn, you cannot water your boats and whatnot. So also in Sweden, we have regions where, where we lack water. Uh, we don't like the long uh, infrastructure of piping and huge pumps to pump wastewater into central uh, uh, cleaning stations, and you have to buy the nutrition to transport it back out to your land to fertilize your crops and whatever. So the invention in this case is to have a compact unit totally biological, we have microbes and protozoans and whatnot to clean the wastewater because wastewater is normally cellulose and proteins and that's what they eat and out comes the clean water. We also have plants, of course, to take care of, of uh, the nutrition like phosphor and, and uh, other part of nutrition. And then you can reuse the water to, to water your lawn or your crops that you have. So already in Sweden, this is, for example, in the archipelago, where the infrastructure is impossible. Uh, it's a great thing. But we see when we come abroad, of course, there is a, a greater need of decentralized wastewater treatment for humanitarian, for diseases, and, and not to have this possibility to reuse water and clean and have it decentralized so you don't have to have an infrastructure for wastewater. Uh, well, this is the normal common sense what we have in, in uh, our industrial plants. We have the linear using of water and that's what we see today. We, we take it for granted. We have it in the toilets, we have it in, in our washing rooms and we just flush it out and we transport a lot of water and nutrition back and forth. What we work, we have invented a, a compact, making a copy of how nature works. Uh, and by that, we can reuse the water and use the nutrition instead of just flushing it out. So we have a circular system. And this is very good example when we have, uh, well, you can move the next picture, aquatic uh, also, growth for, for crops and we use the sewage again for irrigation. We have solar energy and take care of the rainwater. So we have um, a circular system that can be really decentralized to small villages, but also to uh, larger villages and small cities. So this is how it works. Uh, I'm not sure, but this is a copy of, of a small floodage that wastewater comes in and it goes in a particular, very specific, and it's self falling, so you don't need any technician to work with it. And we have microbes and protozoans, and it's pumped over them where we have a high, high uh, feed on the water. And you have plants because plants can take care of uh, the. Yeah, can you know what's that called? Forms, uh, hormones, and also that's we see that when it's released into the nature, you get this fish with three eyes and whatnot. Here, you take care of everything inside the unit itself. So, yeah, we have a, a, a test bed in South Africa to mention one. We have the Venda, where they have students. It's 1,200 students, 1,200 students 
So we have upscaled the system. Uh, so our challenges through this process was to find contractors and maintenance, even though it's very simple maintenance. I mean, it's a pump and it's plants and nature is everywhere. So you don't need a lot of education of the unit and the maintenance itself. It's more that you need to understand and teach them not to put in things that are not uh, biological. For example, we found in the students a lot of condoms, of course, and, and, and stuff, and they are not biological uh, composable. So you need to train them. That was very tricky because the behavior of using water is different from in Sweden. In Sweden, we uh, we take showers and we take everything for granted. But there, it's a more concentrated. We need to adjust the microbes and and uh, the design of the tanks because the waste is more concentrated. But mostly comes to to uh, culture, how and what you put into your sewage. And for us, we have tanks that are two meters high and two meters in diameter. So you see them to the right there. I think that is a picture from Lebanon, actually. But we need a global footprint to produce them because transporting empty tanks is just, uh, no one would pay for that. So global footprint for production and of course, local partners to, to be able to actually train the contractors what's important and how this works. Even though it's very simple, people think also here in Sweden, uh, how can they allocate plants and it's not. So it's a mental mm -hmm. uh, change that needs to be done to use no chemicals, to reuse the water. I know Prips try to make beer out of wastewater. I'm not sure if you try that. I don't think we are ready yet, but we can actually with our co-partners that are making the special filter afterwards, create drinking water out of wastewater. We see in Gothenburg, they have a project where they reuse the rain water, the shower. So everything that we can use the water to, the, the quality out of Trevel itself is that bathing quality, what you have in your lake, where you put your children and where you bathe for the summer. So that's the quality of the water out. So then we can design it. And financing, I would say again, we are a very small company, but we, with a great product from what I see, we can make a container solution for catastrophic areas. You can make it. Because nature is everywhere. And the water where it exists, we can treat it. And the sun is there. And the solar power is there. Yeah. But the money isn't there. Yeah. yeah. That's all the tricky part. Yeah. Thank you, I would say. We'll um, have a, hopefully a few more questions and answers later on. Um, now we'll try to bring in one of our online users, which is uh, Gerard from um, Lebanon. Uh, Gerard, are you with us? Uh, I can uh, say yes. then yes. you are there. Very good. Uh, yes. Uh, OK, uh, I am Gerard from uh, Moruna, Lebanon. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about the Biomap IoT monitoring system. It's a platform uh, for remotely monitoring and operating of wastewater treatment system. Uh, we use uh, multiple kinds of IoT sensors, IoT enabled sensors uh, connected to a, a PLC uh, and uh, sending all the data uh, through a web portal to a cloud based data collection system. Uh, uh, the main feature of the system uh, is uh, <coughs> uh, is actually controlling the uh, the batch of wastewater entering into the system. Uh, so uh, the IoT helps in monitoring uh, the uh, incoming flow uh, that is in the holding tank, and uh, over 24 hours a day, it's helping pouring the wastewater into the system in a manner. Uh, that it would be smooth and uh, eliminate the peak hours in the morning and in the evening. This is one part. The other parts uh, we use, uh, such as the TDS, uh, pH sensors and temperature sensors, uh, also overflow sensors uh, to monitor all the pumps 
and uh, the quality of the wastewater and to have a, an early alarm in case of any uh, problem uh, that will, uh, will occur. Uh, on the other hand, also, we, uh, we do register all the uh, outflow of the system, uh, so we know exactly how much cubic meters per day or per month or uh, over a year we had passed through that system and uh, reused for irrigation or uh, whatever. Uh, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, uh, also, the IoT system helps in, uh, in lowering the, uh, reducing the energy usage uh, uh, by, uh, by controlling the air pumps uh, based on the needs of the wastewater uh, by using dissolved oxygen samples. Uh, it also improves the efficiency and operation. It needs less manpower on the sites uh, to, uh, to observe the, the functionality of the system. Uh, now, uh, for the second question, uh, we did have uh, a few problems. Due to COVID-19, we were faced with uh, multiple lockdowns that affected our ability to work uh, on sites uh, during the development phase. Uh, also, there was a short in equipment supply and uh, sensors used by the system. Uh, now, in, now, by nature, testing uh, with wastewater treatment system takes time to evaluate the needs of a specific sensor or method. Uh, IoT data observation on wastewater treatment uh, takes a few weeks to see if a sensor or method is coll of collecting data is valuable to the system or must be changed. Uh, using expensive industrial grade sensors increase uh, exponentially the system cost. It was a real challenge to cut down to the most necessary sensors to get working system uh, to it, to get the working system. The huge amount of data collected uh, and what to be displayed to the end user uh, in a way to understand the system operational criteria. Those was uh, the most challenges that we faced. Uh, in, in the development phase of the system. Uh, can you please go to the next slide? Uh, and now what would help in the, in the, in the future is, uh, is what we are dealing actually now, try to lower the cost of, of such systems to be available widely, uh, such a way that fit the decentralized wastewater treatment. Uh, so you don't want to, to have the IoT cost uh, uh, as the same cost as the system. Uh, time to analyze the data gathered from the sensor. This is needed to figure out which data is useful and how to use it to design a more effective system. Uh, it needs to be able to handle multiple systems at the same time on the same client platform. An easy way to add or delete features, sensors, models, those uh, features to be developed uh, in the future. Uh, Maroon already installed multiple IoT biomweb for wastewater treatment stations, installed in informal settlement financed by UNICEF. Uh, UNICEF have big interest in our IoT uh, development for biomweb and wants to equip all the wastewater treatment stations with, uh, with uh, such systems. But uh, due to the cut in budget for Lebanon, we didn't get to install any this year. Uh, uh, clients uh, may may also have hundreds of systems to be monitored and uh, grouped by region with user access and privileges. Those uh, those uh, things uh, need to be uh, also developed and worked on in the next phase. Uh, lack of financial support in Lebanon to proceed for further to proceed further with the development. Uh, this is one of the this is one of the biggest challenge also in. Uh, Pushing, uh, pushing forward with uh, this project. Thank you. All right, thank you. I think we got the message here that you have been working with an uh, Internet of Things protocol here to be able to uh, remotely monitor uh, the different um, uh, sanitation systems on site on different places in Lebanon. And, and that has been a, a good job so that now you can better uh, control everything from one monitoring system. Thank you. Uh, big hand for those. Now, please, John, tell us on how it has been working for you with the fuel price energy. Hey, 
Hi everyone, my name is John Neinberg. I'm uh, the founder of PBS Generation, which used to be called Pure Biosynergy, but we abbreviated it a little bit. Our product is called Unit. Um, we have been developing this for four and a half years now. The company is actually seven years old, and the story goes even further back. So basically what we have been developing is this thing from this high. And this summarizes really well, using only air as a raw material and locally produced electricity, we can clean and disinfect water, air and materials for 10 plus years. That's the lifespan of one product before it is recycled. So it's basically a robust, high quality ozone generator, but it's uh, <clears throat> comparing with the conventional ozone generation technology, it's, it's uh, adapted for those humid and harsh environments, like um, on the field, outdoor, humidity is our main thing. So, um, Basically, we purify with ozone where others cannot, with, where other ozone companies cannot, or where it has not been economically or practically viable to do it. So, wrong way. But yeah, yeah, yeah. we can take up the hair. You see that? Ah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. One more. So, just to give you an example. Um, with two cases like that, we can carry out our purification technology in one case, and in the other case, we can carry out the off-grid energy supply. We're, we're now creating a power supply, so with solar panels and these two cases, we can operate anywhere. Um, and what do we do? It's many things. But in this context, and with Swatting Road, we've been developing the crisis, catastrophe, uh, societal redundancy thing, which is basically drinking water purification in those um, exposed areas. So three of those IBC tanks, we can disinfect per day with one unit, or actually at least two and a half, but this gives you an example of how much. That is about the drinking water to 1,000 people. You could drink two and a half liters each. Um, does this work? Yes. Um, here's an example where we have disinfected sewage water. We did this together with Maria. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we had a, a, a dirty sewage water with, uh, uh, what's that called? Bog bath and also. Uh, Dog waters. Yeah. Uh, so. This should be a little bit bigger, but it's like five figures of the like equally intestinal enterococcus, five figures, really high microbial contamination. And after our treatment at the regular flow of this sewage water system, it was two figures. It was actually down to 10 equally, 69 of the others. And this is approved swimming water quality. Um, another thing we did during the project these two years was the disinfect case, like the vessels in which you have water or whatever food stuff. And we had one really contaminated with lots of um, yeah, yeast, sewage water, mold stuff. And after seven minutes of flowing our gas through this keg, it was non detectable. So it works, yes. Um, the challenges we've been facing now to during these years, it's been mostly product development, technical stuff. So it's a lot, and I don't need to go into all this, but like finding a solution to high voltage fields in this thing, heat dissipation, um, how can we make it shock absorbing? How, it's, a, it's a lot of technical stuff and engineering behind it. Um, and more 
market related is basically that we do ozone treatment, but it's more than that because we use humid air. We can tolerate humid air and also we get the benefits from using humid air, which is an even stronger oxidation and disinfection properties. So we need actually to teach the, the market about it because they uh, otherwise they compare with just the general open technology. And they also have their ideas of how do you do it with ozone technology. Usually it's a bit uh, cumbersome, so to speak. You have to have dry, clean air. You have to have a little industrial environment all, almost. And most people that have been working with ozone technology says that, hmm, how does this work out there? So we have to really teach them that this is simple. You can use only this. It's really robust, can tolerate everything, it's foolproof. So finding the early adopters, adopters for the technology. <clears throat> also, one thing is the uh, what, what we face uh, generally as a company is the biocidal products regulation, which will be implemented in Europe. So for this context, mostly it's the we will work outside Europe, but anyway, it's it's something we need to and we have started dealing with. Uh, I don't know how much time. Yeah, one minute. Okay, Just a minute. <laughs> so, so what will help us right now is now after this many years, we have a product, so we need to put them out there on the field, do those pilot cases which we have started, and duplicate them. Like have one successful case that we can duplicate and show, start showing the world. Um, optimizing simplicity is but one thing we're learning all the time. Um, also, start having more reliable local partners where we want to work and where we want to sell. And this is for the long shot, or uh, not a long shot, but a long term investment to start selling to humanitarian organizations. We, we're starting preparing for it, to have the communication about it people involved, but it would be maybe two, three, up to 10 years from now. Um, but we prepare for it. So that's that's it. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you, John. Uh, and we'll now go into the last uh, test event we have had, and that is actually a development within Sweden, actually. So please, roll Q1, are you with us? Yes, Skåne is calling. Can you hear me? Yes, Skåne is calling. Very good. Please uh, tell us about your development. Thank you very much. My name is Rolf Johan Ingeson and I am the CEO of Ingeson Water. And <clears throat> during this stage of the project, Ingeson Water has mainly focused on testing and validating both the core innovation called Millennium Desalination Device which is a single unit of the water purification system and the off-grid container solution called Water in a Box. Uh, when it comes to the single unit of the innovation, there's a few unique aspects of the machine that I would like to point out to you today. Above all, and perhaps the most unique thing about the innovation is that it can both desalinate and purify water from bacteria in the same machine. Therefore, there is no need for different solutions to do one or the other process. This gives our innovation clear advantages over many products on the market today. Uh, unlike some other solutions on the market, we don't purify water with filters, membranes, or some sort of chemical treatment. We produce clean drinking water in a very sustainable and environmentally friendly way. Sustainable as we use titanium to guarantee long lifespan despite the harsh environments the machine will encounter environmentally friendly as we don't have any water loss in the process of making clean drinkable water. An important aspect when it comes to developing markets and humanitarian situation is that it must be easy to perform service when necessary. We have taken this into account in to the design of the innovation and many of the machine parts are stock products that are easy to replace if necessary. Uh, beyond that, the machine is also stipulated in the patent to be both compact, mobile, and scalable when needed. 
Uh, when it comes to addressing the needs in humanitarian context to countries in development, the container solution water in a box is the most suitable. Uh, with the possibility to produce clean water 24 7 just from almost any renewable energy source in the most environmentally friendly way the container is a turnkey ready option that includes everything that is needed to be fully operational on drop down after eight hours since this is a container concept it's both mobile and reconfigurable after a completed assignment and the water in the box concept was validated and tested during the second phase of the project in Eskilstuna wetland with approved lab results on water samples. Okay, Stan, you can take the next slide. Yeah. Okay, you have done that. <laughs> um, every single phase uh, presented in this picture has, of course, its own challenges. And above all that, we have, of course, the pandemic and the atrocious war that has affected all of us in one way or another. Besides that, there is basically three areas that have complicated the progress more than others. During our years of development, we have worked with many manufacturers. Since we have a product that is made in titanium to withstand aggressive environmental conditions, the number of manufacturers is significantly reduced on the Swedish market. We have scanned the market for manufacturer that is qualified to work with titanium material and it is a complicated process and requires special expertise when it comes to, for example, welding. Another obstacle has been finding manufacturers who have the possibility to expand their operation in the event that a serial production becomes relevant. They may be able to participate in the developing of the prototype and even perhaps manufacture the first machine, but then scaling up presents challenges and risks that not all manufacturers are prepared to take. Uh, the last obstacle that I would like to point out is the same, I think, for the most of the, com the companies in the process of taking an innovation to a commercial product, and that is finding the funds. It is a harsh reality that can break anyone if you don't have the goal clear, the stamina and willingness to give 100%. Having said that, I must say that the collaboration with RISE and this project has provided invaluable knowledge and experience that we will take with us in our continued work. And perhaps the last slide. Uh, and to make it simple, uh, for Ingerson Water to enter the next phase and to successfully reach the market in question, it is of importance to find partners in progress. Uh, we have identified three main criteria for that partnership, and that is companies that we can grow a long term, -term partnership with, has the fin financial strength, and finally, it has the experience and international presence. With these three criteria, I think that we would, uh, could have a great chance of entering these markets. And if I could finally just say this, I would like to take the opportunity to thank each and everyone on, uh, to, that has been involved in this project, but especially Stian, mm -hmm. uh, who helped us a lot navigating through the innovation process up to today. Thank you very much, Stian. And for every participant in this project, I say good luck in your future work, and hopefully we will meet in some way in the future. That was my contribution today. Thank you. So we are going into a Q&A at the same time as, of course, we are also a little bit behind. Um, so uh, are there any questions that you would like to raise? Um, are we, um, or are there any from the online? Nothing from the chat yet. No? I think we can. I have a, I have a question. Yes, John. To, to also fantastic innovators. Uh, when it comes to implementation, uh, you have been in test bed position. Who actually was your counterpart during the test bed part? Who did you ex uh, address in uh, Lebanon, Cuba, South Africa, uh, Colombia? No, Bolivia. Sorry. Yeah. So from my side, uh, I uh, we had a co-partner in South Africa that's called Asamuru. So they have this connection with the school project. Mm. Uh, it would be hard to run it from Sweden directly with the counterparts. So to find this specific project, uh, it has to go to this local company. Super, thank you. So the question was, uh, what kind of partners would you have? And um, and there, there was, there has been partners in all of these test beds, actually. Um, yeah, this has been a long process. Yes. How much have you 
are invested in this project? What kind of money do you think? I would say that I could could uh, respond on that. Is that the budgets for the for for those projects have been something between half a million to a million, on those test beds uh, projects. Yeah. Okay, I think we uh, take a break here also for you guys on the on, online, uh, and we'll we'll uh, come back in um, like five minutes after three. Uh, to continue. All right. Take some coffee. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, welcome back to the meeting. Uh, we are now going in for next session. Uh, and that is actually one of the main ingredients of, of this project. Um, we are now moving into a part of the, please, excuse me, please sit down uh, so we can continue the <laughs> workshop seminar here. I'm very happy to see that everybody is having a good um, interacting time. But now we are coming into a um, session where we look on how there's been developed a tool for matchmaking. Uh, what we have seen in the past session was um, what kind of concrete uh, practical innovations that have been during the project. But now we are looking at how can innovators uh, match their products with the World Wide Web, basically, with, a, with the procurement, uh, with all the projects that are out there in, in the world. And for that, we have invited uh, Thomas Strandberg from uh, the company Parametric, uh, who has developed uh, an artificial intelligence um, tool uh, that is actually assisting innovators and all kinds of products to match with, with the need out there. Thomas, are you with us? I'm with you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Now we hear you. Good, perfect. Um, yes, so should I start? Please. Okay, good. I'm going to keep my camera off because my internet is quite um, flaky. So uh, so my name is Thomas and I'm the CEO of Parametric. Uh, and we are a software company based in Lund. Um, and we have developed this tool um, that we, well, the, the name right now is Paralink. Uh, and the reason for that is because the tool is based on something that is called linked data. Um, and I'm not sure how many here that knows what linked data is, uh, but just to summarize it quite quickly, uh, it's open source data that exists on the web. Uh, and it's uh, it consists of a code, so it has like a code standard. And each code also uh, has a title or a description and uh, a summary text to it. Uh, and why it's called linked data is because uh, all of these code systems are potentially linked together. So if you add, if you get, if you connect to a database that uh, that contains uh, one or several of these code systems, you can um, get access to uh, all the data that that uh, these codes are associated with. Uh, and just to give an example. The CPV code standard is uh, like one coding system. Uh, and the CPV codes, that contains uh, a lot of information about procurements. And then you have the SNI code standard, which contains a lot of information about uh, company companies, company information, basically. Excuse and me, then you have the Yes. Excuse me. I just wanted to check with you if we are on the right slide, and you tell me when I should change slide. You can keep this slide. Uh, I'll tell you when to change it. Or I'm I'm actually gonna. I I didn't plan to show the uh, my screen um, and and demo the tool, but I, I think I'm gonna do that anyway, just to give you a glimpse how it looks like in in uh, reality. But we yeah, at the moment we we stick to the PowerPoint, huh? At the moment we do that. Yes. Uh, Global Goals also has their own uh, like coding system, uh, and if you up, if you, if we can access uh, these type of uh, codes systems, 
we can get information through SNI codes about companies, uh, and that includes like every company in Sweden, for example. Uh, and if we have the CPV codes, we can also connect that to the procurements globally. Uh, and if we have the global gold codes, we can see how many global gold codes, uh, global goals that are uh, fulfilled by each company, uh, etc. Uh, so we have created, uh, we have used linked data with uh, text analysis and our AI to create a tool where we can do like matchmaking and optimization. So Paralink, for example, uh, just to summarize it quite quickly, is, is supposed to be like a very easy to use, point and click, intuitive tool that is scalable and that can be used to analyze and optimize the commercialization of projects or products. And we use these open source uh, code to text standards and linked data um, to do this. Um, and the thing is that uh, this has the potential to uh, significantly both improve, but for uh, foremost simplify uh, some aspects of business development. So for example, what we're doing now is to create an, uh, a tool where, that you can use to automatize and optimize uh, very time consuming and resource demanding processes, um, such as like matchmaking. I'm gonna show you how it, how it looks like. So um, this is like the, so when you go to the tool, I'm gonna show you it soon. This is like basically what you see. You get a login page, you add some information about your company, uh, et cetera. So now you can change slide, I think. Uh, and what the first version of Paralink is doing at the moment is uh, it goes through a few steps. So what you do as a product owner or a company is to add some information about your company and about your product. What's, what challenges that are out there and the solutions you your product is uh, uh, bringing. Uh, and the Paralink at this moment, it takes all of this and analyzes it. So the, everything that you put in in text, it analyzes. Uh, and the first thing that it does is to match it with global goals. So you can see immediately, okay, so the information that I have inputted now uh, reaches these goals. And then you get, can go into the, each global goal and see what sub goals that you reach. And if you think that you reach more than the ones that the tool suggests, you can add them to your uh, description automatically with one click. The second thing that happens is it, that it um, generates information that can be relevant to, in this case, procurement. So you, you might want to add this type of information and this type of information, and it helps you like to add that to the description in a fast way. And then when you're done with that process, um, it updates the information you put in with, with these new dimensions of information. Uh, and then it suggests uh, ongoing procurement notices that you can apply for. We also have a system that we are tweaking right now where you can get an estimate about the likelihood. How, how likely is it that you can win this based on the information that you have put in? But I think I'm going to show you just quickly the tool. Uh, uh, so this is basically basically what it looks like. So you want to validate a solution, we call it here. And then uh, you have all the, the different. Uh, uh, let's see where it got. Uh, yeah, it's very it's very small. Um, it's a very small text. Uh, the fonts are difficult to see, but um, yeah. you can just off every screen and and we can see the results. Uh, exactly. Um, yeah, so so basically just you add a bunch of information here about uh, the challenge and the problem and the target group and the outcome. Uh, and you also can add if it's uh, like a prototype or if it's an idea or a concept or a product. And as you can see here, this is a, a desalination company in Lund called Avsalt. I just went to their website and I copy and pasted just a little bit of information here. Uh, so nothing much. 
Um, and what it does is uh, if I go to the next step here, it analyzes these uh, results here. So then I get uh, an analysis based on the global goals, which is one of the coding system that is included now in this solution. And you can see it doesn't reach many goals because it's about um, desalinating water. Uh, but you can see that when it comes to affordable and clean energy and clean water and sanitation, it reaches a few goals. So then I can go in here and see, OK, so what goal did it reach here? Well, it reached this one. Uh, well, I also think it might have potential to reach this one. Then I can add it and it will update um, and use that when searching for procurement uh, matching. And then I might go in here and see, OK, so what water goals did I reach? Well, I reached these two, but I also think that this might be relevant. Then I can add that. Maybe these two, sure. Uh, and when, I, when I'm when i done with that, I can close down here. Um, and it will also suggest um, CPV codes that might be relevant for me. So if I see here, well, drinking water, yeah, that should be there. Um, so then I can. Um, Add, I can search here for uh, drink, for example. Uh, and the thing is that if I click here, then it will add the CPV code drinking water. But the you don't have to. It's the standard in, in Europe um, uh, for procurement, uh, yes. But you don't procurement. have to remember what code it was or what it's about. You just need to understand the, the, like the very basic concept here. So then it will add the whole CPV code to the, the match uh, the you search. Need to go ahead, uh, uh, sorry for interrupting. No, 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 fine. And yeah. here uh, you can add some more information that is maybe more uh, commercial. So uh, it seems like it matches price and serviceability well, but I also think it's a very easy to use thing. So I want to add that as like a feature. Uh, and then it updates the whole uh, information that you put in with these added information and starts to go through the databases of development of projects that you can apply for. So if I go in here, um, it uh, goes in here and I can apply for this maybe if it seems uh, reasonable. Uh, and then I can also see what procurements that are uh, relevant. Uh, and I can also get this is not really functional about now, we're still building it, but you can get more uh, specific procurements here. And then you also get the relevance score. OK, so how likely is it that, uh, how relevant is my description to this actual specific procurement notice? Uh, this and you want this to be as high as possible. Um, uh, so that's basically how it, how it works. That, that's a question I just want to have a clarifying there. there you, you get up a result of the procurements and how many procurements uh, is there to analyze in the World Wide Web? I think uh, Niklas is better to better equipped to answer that question. Between 10 in the CPD purification, between 10 and 20,000 procurements all year at any given moment. And using the UNSPCS, Codes, which are then um, comes from you and by probably use another 10, 15. At this point, the system can find any procurement uh, that is uh, published in the European Union in any language in the European Union. You can get, you can match against the Hungarian procurement and get an assessment kind of probability of winning. Exactly, and now it's kind of for this project built up to uh, look for and match with procurements, uh, but it can be scaled to almost any possible uh, application. Uh, so we are talking with uh, large companies that want to automatize the matchmaking between uh, uh, CVs and um, job, job um, applications with job descriptions. Uh, because that is mostly done manually now, uh, but you can automatize that entire uh, thing. Uh, and we also are also discussing with some members here of the 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 Swatch and Grow team uh, about matching uh, um, projects and products with suppliers, uh, local suppliers. So, for example, if you want to build something in Kiruna, you can find suppliers 
and maintenance and service uh, in like a just a in just a few clicks. Uh, um, that comes to me as well. Uh, all global development projects are you, know, you can actually search for any global uh, two hundred thirty eight thousand countries. Uh, you can just take take my uh, last slide there, 69, and I will just see what uh, if I want to add something before we go on. Is this it? 69? Last slide, go the other way. This one? Um, exactly, and um, we're also involved in this, um, this other project where we can match startups and their innovations with like large uh, corporations and partners. Uh, and you can match it with financing opportunities, etc. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, potential that we are exploring now, and I'm going to leave my email address in the chat. And if anyone has an idea or wants to talk to me and have a meeting personally after this, uh, doesn't have to be today, but can be next week or whenever there's time, just drop me an email and we can set up a one to one meeting. OK, thank you. Thanks. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? OK. Um, from online users, are there any questions there? To Thomas? Uh, that's fine. Uh, so the whole idea of this tool is actually to match make uh, your innovation with the market. And instead of Googling, you can now find the procurements that are actually in there. Applaud for Thomas. Yay. OK, Christina. So now we'll go into to see how Malmö University has been able to develop this area on your, on your end. Uh. I'm Christina Bjarken, as I said before, and I'm an associate professor actually in materials engineering. Uh, and I'm fond of hydrogen embrittlement. I can atomistic level. <clears throat> so you can have different, uh, uh, you can have a, a lot of things within you. Um, but I have really also mission to try to change or develop the skills and also the perspective for engineers to be able to contribute better in modern world maybe. So in the uh, portion grow we our task was to uh, develop a course module on innovating design for humanitarian needs and international development cooperation. And this this course module is actually we had Two courses from the beginning, but not that uh, advanced or not that good <laughs> from my perspective. And then we got this chance to really try to improve it. So very happy for that. And we call the courses or the two parts uh, global product development. You have to call it something. something. Uh, so this uh, global project development. It's both theory and practice. So this is a university course at bachelor. <laughs> um, what we uh, we uh, want to have different students. We don't just want to have one program with one course. So we try to find students from many different disciplines, and we actually get that. So at the moment we have mechanical engineering, materials engineering, mobile IT, construction. Um, project development and design, so. and one master student from IT also, otherwise they are not. And we have had people from industry active also, it's open for everyone, it's online. Uh, so uh, what do we do? We try to uh, make the students understand poverty and this importance of context of um, yeah, uh, outcomes and said that, but let's uh, stop with that. So uh, multidisciplinary students, I've already said that, but the teachers, of course, if you have this kind of course, you need to have very many different uh, experts from different disciplines, but also input from, from, from you guys, for example. 
So we had a, a lot of guest lectures, and that's really good for, for the students. So we appreciate it and it helps them in the development. Uh, so, and um, Niklas is one of the teachers, <laughs> our best teacher. Yep. <laughs> and what do we do for, except for theory? And so then they, we try to give them methods and tools how to, to work in a more um, thought through um, way with methods and also with a tool. So that uh, Thomas just uh, talked about. So last year we, we tried one version of it. So uh, yeah, I think mostly the, the students try to find uh, their project ideas and match them with the global goals. Um, so, uh, so it was like a test for parliamentary as well. So it was a uh, uh, and we really enjoyed that. And uh, now we have a new version. So um, the part two court will start yeah, uh, 7th of November. And then we'll use that for this as a tool throughout the course. Uh, and as I mentioned before, sourcing growth has really made a difference for us. It uh, also, even from my all, uh, increase in my knowledge, <laughs> Because I'm, as you understand, I'm not an expert at all. I'm just, I just have some kind of mission. Because I know engineering students because I was an engineer myself. So, yeah. Uh, let's take another one. So uh, maybe we could call it the learning outcomes. But what do we want the students? Some. I uh, just, I can just mention a few things here. I could go on for. An hour or two, but uh, important thing is to make them uh, give them tools understanding so so they can bridge the gap between technical and social science uh, aspects by doing analysis, not just thinking out of the blue, but a bit more systematic, and then apply these uh, things or, and show that they can do that and they actually do. Uh, um, in a project, so they have the, then they work with development cooperation for some uh, wash solution, and we have in uh, we have had the example at some places in East Africa. So, point. and then they have to show that, and they manage uh, quite well. If if you think of how to start, very it's wonderful to talk about the students' development. And uh, they also get to uh, use, to, to benefit from having a lot of different uh, partners, exp experts to, to try to solve their, their project or try to make a, a good project where they come up with a concept or maybe even further. So, so they learn how that it's important to work not with people that are like themselves and they improve that. And they also learn how to use digital tools uh, and see the, the, the good thing with that. Uh, and now this, when we start with the latest version of Link, so it's going to be very interesting to see how they actually can use that and also give feedback. So to, Thomas um, Niklas so uh, yeah I've probably touched a lot of these things already but uh, we had from just doing developing these courses giving the, these courses uh, a lot of things has happened that is beneficial um, let's start with uh, yeah the number of students just keep increasing. So now starting the thinking of the first part, I maybe have to limit it. Because <laughs> starting to in the beginning. Uh, so that's very nice to see. Uh, so it feels like that's the right kind of course. Um, it helps. Uh, I'm talking everywhere in the university with everyone, try to make them understand what we're doing and engage them. And also people outside, and Niklas is also very. So that has also somehow uh, more discussions around uh, where 
the role of engineers in this kind of conflict or for so for sustainable de uh, sustainable development in general and not just from a social science perspective yeah and i said that we uh, test uh, um, the tool um one uh, great thing that we did together with some partners here uh, it's that we came up with an idea for a master program so two-year master uh, and we have sent an application to get support to continue to develop it to KK Foundation at the Swedish. Uh, yeah, what's it called? They, you can get money from it. <laughs> and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, we haven't already you know, a multidisciplinary research group, or, uh, or really, or at least um, showing that this is really plausible that we will get that. So, Otherwise, they were very, very positive about the idea and found it that these kind of courses must exist. That was really great. So it's like research is the key now. Um, and collaboration, yes. Uh, Chris Nicol, who's in, in this group also from the Umeå uh, University, is one of the teachers. And uh, like I'm with Wigman, I guess. We have talked a uh, lot with uh, regarding this uh, master program, but we um, and others. It's so it's amazing when we ask for a guest uh, lecture from you guys. You say yes, of course. Uh, and so it's also very very nice to be in uh, Swashing Row. Uh, so that is are some of the direct outcomes. Uh, indirectly, we are actually getting the students to start to do their thesis uh, work in this field. It's a bit hard because we need to have partners, so it's not something, but they really want to do with that and we try to facilitate for them. And so that's one. More courses, more course ideas or, or both for the future of master program, but also other things thinking about that yeah, and the collaboration with Union and we will continue to collaborate with Union in way. this and I think this is my last slide yes so because we have this uh, network that also that in the university and outside we feel that we can uh, actually develop new relevant courses so this has really helped us to, to get, because these two courses, they're really good. We have understood that they're really good. Uh, so now we have some muscles to continue. Uh, but, but what we want to do is they're good, but we would like to know how relevant they are for professionals. So both for what kind of students, what kind of students do you want, uh, and how could we help you in your development or so that's something we would like to continue with. Yeah, um, yes, I see that my time is out. <laughs> I didn't see that until now. So, uh, yeah, so I'll stop there. Uh, and um, okay. a, a lot of questions. I want a lot of feedback and questions. <laughs> yes, thank you. So, so it's my son, Dr. I just started technical physics at the University. Uh, last summer, when I started here, I read the whole Bible because we know what I was doing in the laboratory, and now we know that. <laughs> when can you enroll in that, enroll in that course? That's the first question. Uh, this is an open course for uh, all uh, engineering students. Uh, yeah, so that's the thing. We focus on engineers because in social science, that's quite a lot of things related and, to this. So. And if we have two academic children and other friends, what do we have? Uh, international students or yes. international universities yes. that would like to book up for that? Yes, absolutely. That's really our goal. Do you have them already? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, we have. But them. we have had we have international students in the form of this call. They're called Erasmus students, yeah, yeah. so exchange students. They always uh, we have had quite a lot of them in these courses. So. Because that would have a bit of reality from the country that these yeah. students have the point. But we have also have a, a wonderful thing in Malmö because it's such an international city. So uh, a lot of uh, the students come with their uh, relevant backgrounds. So it's very, it's a very 
moved the national. Um, I myself been there as well, lecturing. So it's 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 an ongoing course. You can just register uh, at the moment. Thank you, Christina. Uh, so that's great. So let's now look into next, uh, and that is uh, the on online SAS and Shaba from the uh, Swedish International. Uh, Swedish Incubation Science Box. Uh, are you with us, Sasan? Yes, I am. And hopefully, oh, you can, hopefully you can see me as well very soon. Almost we can see me. We can't see the in, in this room, but I think the online speakers can see you. All right. Uh, so okay. um, you just tell me when I change um, the slide. Yes. Super good. Thank you so much, Stian. Uh, and I wish that I was with you, uh, but unfortunately, I do a, a project in Israel. Actually, uh, I need to to. Yeah, I couldn't be in Stockholm for this that matter. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, this international strategy that we have created, thanks to Swash and Grow as well, uh, is connected to all our members uh, in in. Uh, in the Swedish innovation or part of the Swedish innovation ecosystem, so both incubators and science parks, and of course with a focus on uh, their companies, so it's startups and scale ups. We can take the next slide. Uh, so this is the first time we did it, we do it so systematically, so strategically. Uh, it's for us as well in CISP, Swedish Incubators and Science Parks, as a member organization, uh, it's about to understand what is the need of working internationally or of, as well, is it important to work internationally? And if it is a yes on that, what should we do? What, what is the issues or the challenges that the startups and scale-ups are facing, as well as the, our members, the incubators and science parks as, is facing as well? So we have, this is the first time we have done it. Uh, we have an ambition to do it uh, annually, but for, for now we're gonna do it bi-annually, but in the, in, in the future annually. We can take the next slide. So we have about uh, 60 plus 63 uh, member organizations. It's both incubators and science box in Sweden. Uh, and uh, we had a goal of getting a response of 75% to get like a more legitimate uh, like um, uh, answer or a framing that uh, that we know that we have enough data so we know what decisions to take on. We got we got a response of 85%, uh, and we did uh, 19 deep interviews and 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 what is needed, what's the challenges, or is it important to go internationally? We can take the next slide. So just to give you as well the, the type of organization that are in our member organization, Swedish Incubators and Science Box, uh, it's, it's incubators uh, that works with early stage startups, I would say early stage and a little bit late stage with sc focusing on scaling. And then we have the Science Box that are more focusing on SMEs and scale ups. And we have some of these organizations, some of the members that actually have a incubator in-house as well. So it's both incubator and a science park. We can take the next slide. And one crucial question for us, if they are helping their startups and scale-ups to reach international markets, and if yes, uh, in what amount? So we have 81% of our members that have uh, are supporting in different ways to take their, their, their companies internationally. About 13% want to do it, will do it, but not right now. And about 6%, 5.7% that have no, they don't have that intention. And it's very, it, the one that answered that are very close to, uh, I would say MedTech and TTO, so technology transfer offices uh, that work in super early stage. We can take the next slide. And if yes, so what is needed to do? Well, how do they or how do they want to support the, the startups or the companies? So one uh, very important area, or I, as you see here, four very important areas, but one of them is to 
understand uh, or have an introduction to support or, or soft landing programs that there is a lot in, in, in different countries. Uh, two things that I see as well as crucial is, of course, uh, uh, introduction or identification of potential customers, industrial customers. Uh, this is something that we as well work with. Uh, this is crucial also for going internationally. Also, introduction to potential investors was very highlighted, uh, as well as market entry program. We don't do market entry program, but we know that Business, business Sweden, for, for example, do that, that type of activities. So this is the four areas that were interesting, but we see as well like competitive analysis is important, research, uh, finding potential partners is important and other type of activities. We can take the next slide. We connected this as well. I, we, I think we can go to the next slide as well for that. Thank you. So I couldn't fit this in, in one slide. So we have as well connected this to uh, the, the smart specialisering that is in, in, um, in Sweden. It's a work that has been done by the regions. Our members have been working with that. Because it's as we got the information from our uh, partners, uh, sorry, our members, that it's not always about taking companies internationally, but they work as well with taking international companies to Sweden to make Sweden more attractive uh, and, and more innovative for sure. And of course, creating job in the end. We can take the next slide. I had one other slide. I think it's disappeared somewhere, but just one thing regarding uh, the initiative that we do, like when, when they are supporting the companies, because I had some slides of which com uh, countries they are prioritizing. Uh, so like, for example, US, Germany is very high level, but we see as well like India, very important, uh, South Africa uh, or Africa, I would say in specific countries and that UK, uh, Canada, for example. But what they said, even if they do programs for a specific country, I can send you, of course, the slide. They always focus if a if a if a company of uh, in their like accelerator have uh, are getting a deal in Spain, they will try to support them in that country, even if they are not focusing in that country. So they work very need based when it comes to the the, the startup scale up needs. And just to summarize this, uh, it's of course much more in detail, the last picture. Uh, the key focus activities that we see is that we need to work, for example, with, uh, I, I saw it men be mentioned, the matchmaking. We see, we do a lot in Ignite Sweden, uh, creating tailored meetings uh, to create commercial pilots or projects between corporates, municipalities and startups, as well as strategic collaborations is important, like, uh, incubator to incubator internationally to do a benchmark or learning peer reviews together as well as working with talent interaction have been very very specific it's a big need uh, as well like working with the government on this issue as well as and talent attraction is divided in two areas so it's both talent as individuals but also commercial so more of of establishing startup scale-ups or corporates in sweden and we have some success cases, for example, ID on Science Park and, and Link Shopping, for example, and other members that are doing that really well. I'll just stand there. There's a lot of other activities that we have in this, this game plan. Uh, I see that the time is running out, uh, but I would be happy, of course, to, to present or to send you the, the more specific uh, uh, international strategy that we have created. Thank you, Sasa. I just want to ask you, you're working quite early uh, with, uh, with in the innovation development cycle, isn't it? I mean, your, your science parks have quite early startups. And the, no, that's, a, that's the incubator. The, the science parks works uh, more with late stage, I would say. More scale up, more SMEs. Good. So you have found out, um, so there are... If you are an, uh, a new startup, you get in touch with one of your science parks and you will uh, work on your, you will assist in the internationalization and export. Yeah, of course. And uh, we have done some, actually, this, this international strategy have now initiated a lot of both international matchmakings, but also delegations where we do 
learning sessions between incubators to incubators or science box to science box. This is what we're going to do in Israel, bringing corporates, startup scale-ups, investors and incubators to, to Israel uh, for a three-day pro program. That's going to happen next week. So we see that that will that will happen in Germany, France, South Korea, uh, Brazil, Canada, for sure. That's guaranteed for the next year from our, our side. And of okay. course, if you have, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any, we will have questions also in the end uh, if there are anything to raise here. Otherwise, uh, I think we'll move on and uh, listen to uh, Win Water, who has been uh, part of the game as well. Uh, you've done a couple of events. Uh, Olof, are you with us? I'm here and hopefully you can hear me as well. Yes. Very welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, great listening to Sasan earlier. Uh, so we do uh, in Win we do a little bit of similar, but a little bit in a different way. Uh, so Win, uh, what is it? Uh, in this case, it's mostly Win Water uh, that's represented. Uh, we see ourselves as a marketplace for innovations. Um, we have currently three. Uh, such market places running uh, and a fourth is still waiting to be fully fully operational uh, but the ones that's running are wind water that has uh, is actually celebrating its its 10 year anniversary uh, 10 year anniversary this year uh, we have wind guard that has been running for some four years wind energy is some three four years old uh, and as i mentioned wind food is still uh, still uh, waiting to be fully launched. Uh, so what is an innovation marketplace, you may ask yourself? Um, well, it's uh, if you have an idea, if you have a startup, if you want to change something, uh, if you're coming with something new, this is the place to come to uh, and to present to others uh, that may help you uh, with some feedback on your ideas. Um, and this it goes um, often the companies that we meet, the startups that we meet are, are early stage in the beginning uh, and they need some some feedback on their ideas, um, which they will get and uh, then they will hopefully stay with us for quite a while and they will improve and then they will also get some help with marketing uh, and even export in the long run. Uh, so why would do we do it? Uh, um, well, uh, we want to speed up the uh, 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 the uh, uh, time it takes for a company to make impact, and we want to do that, of course, to create a more sustainable future. Um, and we do it by very actively connecting people, and we do that very physically. Uh, now again, with the physical meetings, uh, we have been uh, before. A couple of years now uh, doing it online, which works so-so, I would say. Uh, we, we've done the best of it, uh, but still it's uh, so much better when you can meet face-to-face. -face. Which uh, brings me to uh, my, my uh, excuses for not joining you live today. Um, and uh, uh, this way, we hope to bring some very disruptive solutions uh, to the global market. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So who are our members? Most of the members are ac actually innovation companies, uh, small startups. Uh, some of them are not so small anymore. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Windwater has been active for 10 years. And um, Two of the companies actually that presented on the first meeting 10 years ago are still still active innovation companies in wind water. And uh, um, let's say that they are moving on different phases. Um, some move faster, some move a little bit slower. Um, for some, the road is quite straight. For some, it's uh, winding, uh, so to say. Uh, but um, among those, um, innovation companies and among the the partners the large partners that are also active in the network uh, we have uh, at the moment 15 countries represented 
So it's not just the Swedish network. Uh, we have European members. We have uh, some um, some US members, and we also actually have um, Africa represented in this network. Next slide, please. Uh, so as we see it, we see the world where very black and white. Uh, the large partners that um, are the main contributors to what we do also economically. Uh, we see them as representing the market, the need for new solutions. Uh, this is not always the case. Sometimes they also come with a, come up with a lot of good innovations, actually. Next slide, please. Uh, and those larger partners are the ones that are shown on this uh, at least quite uh, updated uh, slide. Uh, I don't see any anyone that shouldn't be there uh, specifically at the moment, at least. There are a few missing, though. Um, which I won't mention at the moment. <laughs> um, the innovation companies, as I said, black and white, they're the providers of solutions. Uh, sometimes they are also could also be the customers, actually, and they could also sometimes sell to each other, one providing uh, a part of the solution for another one. Next slide, please. So some few keys to the win model. Um, we always want to have a business focus in what we do. do. It's uh, mostly this is about finding business opportunities. Sometimes we can do projects, we can do some um, public financing, but it should, should be uh, with the aim of a business, uh, a future business. Uh, can take two slides forward. Um, and what, what, what we see as very important is that the entrepreneurs meet potential customers very early. Sometimes the entrepreneurs come to products that they think are good for a specific market or specific type of customer. And it just turns out that those customers are not that interested and uh, they, they just have to turn to, to someone else instead. And, and uh, to get that feedback, uh, you cannot that get that feedback early enough. Next slide, please. Uh, we see ourselves at, as a complement to the traditional innovation system with the incubators, the uh, um, uh, different kinds of startup support uh, and finance support uh, that we have uh, that, for example, the uh, uh, organizations in CISP provide. Um, and where we can bring a little bit of different uh, angle uh, to help help startups to the next level. So I already mentioned the win meetings. Uh, this is our toolbox of uh, of things that we do, things that we can uh, work with. Um, the win meetings uh, at the moment, physical. Next meeting is actually on the 27th uh, of October. It will be in Malmö. Uh, you can also join online. Uh, and uh, uh, I could send also actually uh, an invite for that meeting afterwards, unless you haven't got the, the invite already. Uh, this meeting will be uh, extra international. Uh, we ha have uh, invited um, some of the largest, actually, water utilities in Europe will be present, such as uh, Aqualia and Seven Trent. Um, and that, that's uh, how we will try to go forward to, to do the meetings, both at, at the live version, but also webcast them in, a, in an online version. Just, just to call, <laughs> yep. just to into the project here, what what kind of activities have you done within the project uh, of of these the toolbox? Yeah, uh, in in the project we have done a, a full win meeting with the theme of uh, Swash and Grow, and also with the uh, uh, companies uh, in Swash and Grow presenting at the meeting. Um, uh, at that meeting, of course, we had the win win mingle map. Unfortunately, it was uh, during the pandemic, so it was uh, one of the uh, digital events, uh, which makes the mingle map a bit different. Uh, it, the, that, that's uh, how we, in the digital version, we, we send people out in uh, in breakout rooms, uh, but it's uh, not. Uh, these are planned breakout rooms, so we can kind of match people in the breakout rooms. Um, uh, we also done a. Uh, 
innovation studio, uh, which is kind of a workshop that we did in uh, in uh, connection to one of our other meetings uh, that was on the theme of the Swatch and Grow project. Um, and, and to the innovation studio, we then have the kind of extensions going into an innovation lab and then an innovation consortia, which is like uh, actually working together a partnership of startups, uh, established organizations. Uh, it could be uh, universities. It could also be uh, government organizations to um, come up with a, a solution, future solution or product. And uh, mentioning here, one of the consortia we have been working with for a long time is the uh, uh, fossil free fire truck uh, in Wingard, which is actually being realized at the moment. So the, that's uh, that's my full presentation and um, you're all very welcome to our meeting in Malmö, uh, 27th of October with Windwater. Um, more information to come and yeah. I, I will take questions, of course. Yeah, we will have uh, questions and answers um, afterwards, but if there is uh, something in connection to this, we understand that WIN has done some of the of the um, meetings. I know that, John, you have been part of it. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Did you get any good connections for development, developing your product? Yeah, developing in market countries. And, uh, yeah. Yeah? Networking is always good. Yeah, good, good. Thank you, Olaf. Thank you. So we have come from the academic through the science parks and the wind water innovation labs, and now we're going down to uh, some uh, looking out in the world. How can innovation be transferred out and come to the need holders? Holders, uh, please, Jürgen. If you could just tell us a little bit about Electricity, uh, Urban Tech Sweden, a test battery system delivery and scaling. Which one? That one. Okay. okay. So um, I represent Electricity, a citizen initiative in Hammarby Sjöstad. That's a city district in Stockholm. And this is our humble mission. Remember that we're a citizen initiative, right? Very humble. So uh, Electricity is a quarter of the units. So we work with, we have about 80 partners and members and they're funding our projects. Um, this is the other half. So we do, we do collaborate with business academia, public actors and citizens, and that's our USP. We actually have a lot of citizens on our side um, working on practical projects, trying to be Climate neutral by 2030 in our city district. So um, we're working with innovations and engagement. And uh, we see Hammarby Kröfstad 2.0 as a test burden for energy transportation, digitalization and circular economy. So we have about 30 projects running yearly and about 11 research projects. So we're funded by our members and also uh, through research by money from energy authorities and Vinola and so forth. So we work with knowledge as a carrier for behavior change. So the idea is, of course, not only to work in Amal Kajastad, it's to actually carry these innovations out in the world. That's the whole idea. So the companies that are coming to us, we're setting up practical projects so they can actually test their, uh, their innovations in a real environment, with real people and real money to see if it carries through, right? And um, so we had a lot of matchmaking events uh, five years ago. We brought in Chinese cities and Indian partners, and we did send a lot of innovative companies out there in the world. It didn't happen that much, to be honest. They got a great reply and they got you know, partners to meet, but they were not strong enough. So that's why we joined Urban Tech Sweden, funded by Technique for Tagen in 2019 with Hans Fried that left us now. He was here an hour ago, but she is on the way home. <laughs> but anyway, so we're working in Urban Tech Sweden. It was funded by some partners here, Sviank, 
that's one solution, electricity, herbs, and so forth. And we're working with innovative ideas and companies for climate neutral cities. That's the goal. And Urban Tech Sweden is a project accelerator for Swedish business community. And we structure projects into sharp investment cases and bring in the ecosystem needed. We be, we'll want to be the platform that individual innovative companies do not have and take the overall responsibility towards potential customers. So we sort of turned it the other way around. Instead of sending the companies out there, we brought the projects home. So these companies don't have to travel abroad. And it's funded and it's financed and it's insured and it's jurisdiction, blah, blah, blah. So it's easy for innovative companies to actually be out there through our commercial arms, which are doing the job. That's the whole idea behind Urban Tech Sweden. And this is one project. Governor Island in New York City, where Bill Kumo, was it Bill Kumo? But said he wanted to have a global climate center, the former mayor of New York, right? And Urban Tech Sweden is being part of setting the infrastructure plan. There are 21 switch companies there now to see if they can work it out. Another one is Hudson Square, uh, Heinz, uh, one of the biggest uh, property developers in the world. And there are six companies there now, you see. And then, of course, this is what we've been working in, swatching grow. And Morton and Victoria will tell you more about that. So that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. So that's great. Uh, Jan will continue here to speak more on Urban Tech Sweden and, and um, how you have been working in the project with uh, this case. Yeah, Höge Klicka. Or Höge Klicka. Höge Klicka. Höge Klicka. That was my slide too, sorry. Actually, this is uh, Svea Kostnot Rydian, original member in this project. I uh, work together with Volkan here on Capital Guiding. Uh, but I have also happened to be the chairman of Sveak. So this is the reason why Sveak come into play in the project. And actually played, yeah, I will say quite a, quite a good uh, part of the project in a certain stage. So this turned out to be some kind of a proposal for a portal and a possible continuance of the project. Um, so uh, the project, uh, when it comes to the fact that it should go into operation. It's, uh, it, we had a, a lead in Rwanda, but it didn't work out, unfortunately, uh, or maybe good for us. I don't know, but at least it turned out to be uh, turning towards Tanzania. And this was to find a project opportunity and innovation. And then we had in the group, we had Esman and, uh, and uh, Novohit, that uh, will tell us more about this concept and why it's, it's a good example. So we try to find a location with local support, potential project opportunity. One of the members in Sveak is Samrek, Transibar Recycling, short form Samrek. And they are a Sveak member. They have an ongoing uh, business, the waste management of Tanzania. So they were also in a step where they actually look for development, waste energy, because now they have enough raw material, I mean waste, to go further. So they was picked as a counterpart and introduced to them uh, the EcoBarge um, Eco system that we will tell more about later as an alternative for this. And this was connected. Uh, through UTS uh, Urban Tech Sweden and the project of Swash and Grow. And then it was an echo barge evaluation from Esmar uh, and, uh, and, and Nova Heat. And this was chosen. And they met in, um, uh, in uh, with Sandrek, uh, also connected to something called Manta Resort. They have an underwater hotel, quite famous for this one. Uh, and they have a local foundation, Kanini Foundation, which also was interested to support the local village uh, with, with energy at that time. This has developed a lot, and you will hear more about it after uh, finalized. Then the pre feasibility study was, was uh, established. It was financed by Smart City Sweden. And uh, 
uh, Morten and Victoria was on the plane the, mo plane the Monday after. It was uh, <laughs> very quickly, uh, great initiative, and developed this pre feasibility. Suddenly, everything puts on hold because the local government was not allowed to give energy prices. And suddenly, it was on hold for, I don't know, four weeks, five weeks. Uh, then, uh, we have a good dialogue with the Embassy of Tanzania here in, in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. And the ambassador, in a few days, she came up with a local guy at the central department, central government in, in the Dar es Salaam that was allowed to give a price on the electricity on Zanzibar. So suddenly, the project will continue. And this is a typical holdup, as I believe that every uh, person and every entrepreneur in these developing countries turn into. That means that you don't really have the right connections all the time to move the project forward. And this was a, crew, uh, a, a key element to actually continue. So thank you to, to Ambassador Brace. She is, uh, was uh, willing, uh, receiving and giving audience to, to the crew and uh, is now in the position to continue the feasibility study. Uh, so why do we use the Chamber of Commerce in this kind of work? Uh, I can use Svea as an example, but you have these kind of chambers in more or less all countries. So this is an example. Uh, so we are mainly working with four, uh, four uh, countries. Uh, that actually have the embassy in Stockholm, it's the Nordic countries in Stockholm and Copenhagen. So that's Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda. They are in Copenhagen. We also have a collaboration agreement with the local Chamber of Commerce in each country. It's uh, uh, KEPSA, uh, Kenyan Private Sector Alliance, Private Sector Foundation in Rwanda. Uh, Tanzania Chamber of Commerce in, in Industry and Agriculture in Tanzania, and uh, the um, Uganda National Chamber of Commerce Industry in Uganda. So these are our counterparts. They have a lot of local members able to provide with partners, which you need as a counterpart when you are moving to a certain country. So this is something that we actually can provide today, and this is also what was the offer and what this way I can contribute, uh, contribute with when you come to these kind of cases. <clears throat> this uh, process of taking uh, that actually can support us will also be supported by the evaluation process that mm -hmm. is in um, within the urban tech, urban tech Sweden, where there's a project evaluation process that actually will support to make any project bankable, so you can actually continue with this. So it's a SWEAC introduced uh, uh, that actually can feed with the information, but you can do the evaluation of the project through this uh, uh, urban tech Sweden and electricity um, part. This is so interesting. <laughs> Phase one, as for the world, Tanzania, Sweden, and uh, TCCIA. The second one was that this is the partners in the second phase, Urban Tech, under Urban Tech Sweden. Now comes the key element. Small and medium-sized companies was invited to be part of the project. And this was on a certain seminar on May 19, where all these companies was invited to be part of the project. That means SMEs was invited to be part of a project that uh, is the most long low, low hanging fruit you can wish for in sales. You're invited, please come and join us. Instead of uh, running around in East Africa looking for, looking for project. It's a huge, huge difference. So phase number four, I believe we will listen to after, after my speech. So what we have decided to, to try to continue in is to make an SME uh, portal where we actually can feed in projects like it was explained from Parametrics, the Paralink, where you actually have coded information 
that you can look for. You can, this is an example, but you can have any embassy supporting the projects, any chamber locally uh, anchored in the country. In this case, Tanzania, and you also have Swedish promotion organizations if they like to join, like Disney Sweden. And you can also add in the project financing and put together, uh, in this case, uh, both uh, uh, a specific project, location, what company, what size of the company that you have, uh, as the one, do a certain analysis on the, the funding and come up with a project and a funding list in together and put this into the evaluation project process that urban text will. This is something we are aiming for. We try to uh, go further as a follow up to Swatch and Grow. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to discuss this afterwards. But this is a project where it will involve most of those who have been part of BP5 in Urban Tech Sweden, if they like. And you can send an email. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. So uh, you will, uh, Morten and Victoria, you can come up. So we, actually, will, uh, we would like to invite new people to this team. So Victoria, Terry, Ellen International, please join me. Okay, Perfect. all right. So just uh, to keep on John there, so you will actually, your intention is to use the parametric tool uh, in this in this work. All together. All together, yeah. Oh, let's see if I can learn this. Yeah. That's okay. This is the camera. This is the camera. Is the camera. So it's better to stay here. Okay. I'll be on this side. Yeah. Okay. I'll be on this side. Please join up. Great. You are the key. Okay. So, um, Sorry. The, the, uh, the benefit of being an entrepreneur is that you can be completely. I'm sorry, you closed the camera. Completely yeah. I have to go. Uh, right. So, the uh, ambition with Equibosh, which has been an example of the swap and grow, is uh, to turn dreams into real political feasibility studies. My name is Morten Björk. I'm, as mentioned, commercial of Urban Sex Sweden, member of the city, of course, member of SPHERE. Uh, have been very happy this project received the support from Smart City Sweden uh, in terms of, of the feasibility financing, together with Sandvik like as mentioned. Um, so what is the next echo barge? Well, it actually, this started for us when we were surprised in Iraq uh, after the war. No one can provide electricity. We did floating power plants, that time based on fossil fuel, we did oil and for food program in Iraq. And this is the, where the idea came from. So, but now we do it within the economy concept. So we focus on water, electricity, charging, cooling on sustainable floating platforms. But in principle, that is nothing you cannot put on a ship. There is not, not one single technology that we cannot integrate. Uh, so EcoBarge is a private company. You can say it's a startup. Uh, our focus is to provide entrepreneurial opportunities in line with the SDGs. And as we can incorporate anything, we meet all the SDGs. So the team uh, behind, uh, we have done more than 1,000 projects in 50 plus countries on five continents. Anything from balancing wind farms and, and solar plants to nuclear power projects to, uh, I mean, you name it. Uh, so it's quite an experienced team behind us. Uh, our offer, as mentioned, there is almost nothing we cannot integrate. And uh, this is one key. We have identified two major hurdles for innovation companies to develop. Uh, one is that we shall come into pre feasibility money. Wherever you go locally in the world, it's the locals who know their needs, but they don't have the funding to uh, present them. And if you go to investors, they want finished business uh, Opportunities presented to them based on business pre finalized uh, pre feasibility studies, minimum, uh, where well, they can calculate their return on investments and uh, make sure that there are bankable service supply, etc. And for the innovation companies, as we have heard, many of them have very good innovations. Sweden is very good in developing bits and pieces. It's like we do the best drills in the world, but the end users need holes finance. 
So we were everything in between and doing this turnkey, also involving local integration and production. So what is the benefit? Well, floating is a big benefit. We don't need to occupy land. That makes bureaucratic processes easier and land can be better used locally. We are mobile. This means for the investors, uh, we provide much higher security. Simply, if the customer doesn't pay the bill, move. Uh, scale, uh, we can uh, uh, scale, we are modular. So we can scale adding uh, functions, adding capacity at any time. You, you are fully sustainable as well. Let me say one as sustainable we can be, depending on how we are working and which uh, what, what we integrate. Innovative, yes, we are existing more than 25 year lifetime floating pilot plants. Currently, we have all with the city and IVL to do bathing houses in, in Sol Mount and, and uh, on the first of we all with IVL doing 50, 100,000 cubic meter uh, cleaning of water projects in South America. We are happy to be involved with Business Sweden and, and the Energy Agency in Indonesia now to bring on these solutions. So, uh, yeah, so you can say that we are innovative, but we focus on the business modeling and the concept, also providing for other innovative, innovative companies, as uh, John described before, with all the technologies we included. We provide turnkey, not bits and pieces. So we become the clients to the customers. Hence, we can have the May 19 event where we integrate all the, the people coming to us that present here. And then we are customized. We based on pre feasibility studies with a form for the end users. So it's actually the end users who tell what they need. We customize the client flow for it and we deliver and we can even operate to our key. Modular, we can add uh, capacities, functions at any time. Uh, as soon as there's a new technology or another need, we can work on grid or off grid. We can even do floating solar within Typhoon. And that's so it. Climate resilient, uh, yes. It's just a matter of dimensioning and designing. So this is really the EcoWash concept. We start with the end users, communities, industries, cities, resorts, whatever, where they support us in the pre-feasibility studies uh, to define their own needs. When we then, and this is also where we really hope to cooperate with CIA. And here today, we are so happy that we're today signing with LM International. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so with LM International in general, and for a certain product in particular, Pence, Eric here, and uh, Victoria. Victoria is responsible for the feasibility study that will take place. Eric will represent the, the, is representing the, the community in Baraka. So we then, based on the pre feasibility studies, we form project companies, SPVs, or you can say ship owners company, who will own the barge. They will take in investors, and we work with a lot of project financers around the world. But as mentioned, they need a pre feasibility studies finalized than done to, to work to, to continue. So this way, we can actually do service providing for end users. We can work with what you call build on operate or even build on operate transfer basis. So we can therefore support gender equality. We make the people we talked about before who have less uh, capabilities, they can have actually become owners of the means of production. Uh, EcoWash then take on to build and operate, uh, make sure that operation maintenance work, educate the local community so they are capable of later being both employed and uh, take over the plants. And this way, we then can scale technology providers with positive cash flow, organic growth. I tried this business model myself. We supply more than five gigawatts of thermal energy storage based on a company where we only invested 100,000 Swedish crowns. Mm. The rest was positive cash flow, organic growth. And to be honest, we're, I'm also now doing exit from this company at a very high figure, enabling me to be investing myself in EcoBot. Right? We're talking hundreds of millions. Uh, okay, <laughs> now we come to this, uh, so I know it works. So here we come to the case uh, that we are just talking in particular now that we will cooperate on. This is then the floating pilot plot in Baraka. Eric will soon tell you what, what, what that can, what change that can make. Uh, so we had uh, presentations with the local entrepreneurial community. And for me, the biggest take of this was not only the 200 local entrepreneurs we had the project presented to, it was the question for one female entrepreneur. Now she said, why should I believe in this? There are so many aid product percentages that always fail. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, that's a good question. But I can say one thing. If this is going to be successful, we should make money on it both of us. 
because that's the only way that we can continue operational maintenance of whatever is supplied. And then she understood the business model that we call actually business model. And this is the first time I've been eating something. Mm -hmm. That was really educational for us. It's a good takeaway. So we have been invited by the major in uh, Baraka. We aim to go there in January to uh, continue with the going to more feasibility stage for the pre-feasibility we started. Uh, so we have, this is the, from the committee of the Global and Global Consumers. Uh, so this is in principle the project. EcoBarge will provide a floating solar station. We will have a floating plant in Tanganyika that is modular, scalable. We can increase capacities. We start with a pilot that we can scale it up, add functions, doesn't matter if you need internet, or if you need more water, or more electricity, or cooling, or fish, or drying. Did you know that 80% of the certain type of fish they catch there is destroyed because they cannot dry it? Like when we did the Tanzania case, I was so happy to receive support from. We came to turn a resort into an eco resort. We came back and decided that we should cool fish. Because 30% of the fish was destroyed, rotten, because they cannot cool it. And we have conceived from the pre-facility done, as supported by Small Ticket Sweden, that we had 12 months to build a plant. As we used ship financing on a project, it took one year thereafter for the investors to get all their money back. Simply because you used all the fish that was otherwise lost. And this means we can then, in the Zanzibar, we can then arrange that the local community become employed, can cool the fish and sell it. And when the investors get their money, we give them the plant. Right? So in this case, we have a similar concept coming up now for Tanya and Nika. Here, you have floating solar, you have energy storage, we provide water, electricity, and then here is where we stop. Right? So the local community then will have the water tank on the land we supply to. They will have electrical substation we supply electricity for. Mm -hmm. So this is also where we hope to work with SIGA and others to provide the guarantees for the local community to build their infrastructure. And at the same time here, we will, would like to have the help of everyone to sort to help us with the pre-feasibility studies. Because be sure, if we can hear in the pre-feasibility study that we also have funding ourselves, right? If we can here show the business case, no doubt we get the project financing, especially if we have guarantors to ensure that the end users are bankable for the services. So benefit communities, we create jobs, uh, we uh, can provide off-grid production areas, scalability, we minimize land uh, occupation, uh, no need to prepare land, very less environmental impact, uh, we reduce CO2 emissions, even when we'll be able to trade, do the carbon trading here, and we provide the means for other entrepreneurs locally to develop their business. So there are many benefits here for innovation companies, rapid growth, organic growth. Can you imagine now this financial term will be increasing? Can you imagine if someone comes to you and say, why don't you come and meet us in Sweden and we will provide an order with you where you have a down payment covering your deliver development cost and you don't need to dilute your shareholding to other investors to invest in the companies. Let's do it through orders instead. And then you have your automatic your pilots and testers worldwide on eco margins. So, uh, we then finance this through orders. So, and we integrate the small bits into an operational plant. We guarantee operational maintenance locally where we educate, reduce warranty risk, and we protect the IP through shareholders agreement in the project companies, which is also then a higher IP. Uh, so, investment, even for the, for the innovation companies, they can become their own customers. So, this is a little bit about the project steps. We are now entering a deeper pre feasibility stage in uh, Congo Kinshasa. Uh, there, after that, we have means of feasibility financing where we start to project companies. And then you can see, as for many projects, we go to feasibility with a third party also then evaluating that what we do is true. Project financing, design, construction, commissioning, operation. And in the end, the investors exit. We take on to put our own sheep in there to, to operate and maintain. Uh, concept design, pre feasibility. Yes, Victoria, here with that picture. <laughs> yeah. That was the that was done on the specifically that we actually implemented in Tanzania. So it was we were there on like locally speaking with local people, visiting the communities, understanding really what is their needs. And based on what we understood and discussed with them, we started the security development. That is why the Smart City Sweden 
visibility was divided. We did for Echo Barge and for Echo Resort as well. So we just uh, you know, they delivered two of them. I think that we have uh, not enough time to discuss. I would like to come back to Barack and Eric. Yes, about we will do that. So I will say that here we have the contact is with Victoria. If you have an innovation, you want to get into the system. If you have your project, you want to work with us. So happy. And uh, I'd like to end with two things. One saying that after this, in the next break, we'll have a signing ceremony with LM International to support the feasibility study in Paraka and to have a long term cooperation, for which I'm so grateful. And now I would like Eric to finalize this presentation by telling us what difference will Neko Borch make in Bali. Thank you, uh, My name is Eric, as you, you heard it. I'm a French speaker. I speak French um, naturally, so I will try some English. And I think some of some of you uh, know me already. And uh, Christina, we have met, you don't know, through CLOS, through a project with some university in Congo. And I was so happy with those ideas of innovation. I was so happy. <laughs> so, um, Sorry. Yeah. And I was also in contact with different students from um, your university uh, doing this uh, kind of uh, bio technique in Uganda. So I, I, I was part of this as well. So I like, I love innovations. And what we uh, we can say about Congo, Maria said it, we have AI, we have everything, we have resources, but we lack technology, we lack resources, but we have everything in, in terms of potential, maybe we can say we are the richest. With the Congo, a seen forest and everything, so we can say we can do everything. But the community I want to talk about is Baraka, since you said I represent the, the population of Baraka. So this population is there, a huge town, I can say. And in the, city, in the town, no water and no electricity. Have you heard about it? Have you heard about a town with, with no yes. water and with no electricity? <laughs> this is barrage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so when I heard about this concept of Okoba, I just said, this is the only idea, and that's what even we, uh, women in the, the conference said, this is not true, that's a dream. And now we can see it's not no longer a dream. With uh, good people in front of us, we hope that the project is going to come through and we will make it. So Baraka has five universities with no electricity, even one bar. Baraka S17 health center, including hospital with no electricity. You can see the situation. Baraka S20 school with no electricity, nothing. Baraka is different infrastructure, schools, churches, or whatever. No electricity, just one generator in the world cell town. And the generator was given on political agenda. For the politicians to get elected, they just just come for this, and when they don't, they are not elected, they disappear with their their things. You can see this. So it's a city which is insecure in all the situation. So what we can say is to show you that if Eco Badge is implemented in Baraka, one of the aspect is first of all to address gender equality. And why do I mean, why, why in, am I interested in gender equality as a Congolese, a, a black guy? Because I was raised by my mother and I see how it's so amazing to be raised by a woman, a woman. And my mother was one of my inspiration. That's why I loved a lot this issue, the concept of gender equality. And when I see all these women, Going to the uh, to the to the beach, waiting for the fish fisherman, a fisherman. I mean fisherman. No woman is a fisher in the lake. So men collect the, the fish from the lake, and at the the shore, women are there to wait with their basket to buy this fish, and they have to sell this fish in one or two hours. You know that. And if they don't sell this fish in two hours, then this uh, they, are, they get rotted. And their capital disappear, vanish. So Echo Badge will address this issue. Women will get access to the health center. The school will get electricity, so children can get uh, get distance education or computer knowledge or everything. 
So this is the word, hydric diseases disappear. Deforestation around the town will, will be reduced. So all, these are some of the aspects we can just uh, summarize for this project. So it's a wonderful project. Please, you, are, you have done a great job. So we are so happy that you have funded this project, feasibility study. And thank you for thank your you. support. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. I, I, I was great to hear some some um, <coughs> witnesses from the south uh, in this uh, <laughs> in this work. Um, okay, we we are um, uh, about closing. We can have some questions here. Um, what would be uh, just a first question from my side? What is the sort of uniqueness with this one, uh, this kind of work? Uh, would you say? Um, when it comes to this kind of this, because this is a sort of a pilot on on how to do an off grid installation. Well, first, I say one thing: yes. this is a miracle. And I was thinking about my son reading the Bible for me this summer. I never read the Bible myself. There's some story about five fishes and three cornbreads. <laughs> they fed the five thousand. You have done that through technology for the fishermen and the women. That's why you're it. Thank you. Appreciate it. And this is really also interesting because, as also described by Eric, if you talk about gender, it's quite interesting. So you can imagine when the female entrepreneurs become the owners of the Echo Bond, they become the employers. Mm. Do you use your employer? Rarely. Okay, so it, it creates jobs uh, locally. Yep. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Very, very good. Um, thank you. Um, yeah. Do we go on with the signing now, or we wait until a little bit later? We take it in the middle. We do it in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Very good. He's very eager to get this signature. I know what. He goes for us too to take a meeting with with Sita to support us in this, right? Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's now then see if I can keep on here. Uh, um, what we have seen is uh, uh, some examples from the project, uh, which means that I mean the Swash and Grow project now. Um, and are there any sort of, uh, are, are we, uh, we have any more questions to, we have seen now uh, the Malmö University course to be developed for engineers. We've seen that science. Science parks and incubators in Sweden have become stronger in their internationalization strategies, and we have also seen that Green Water has done some some um, events to connect. But we have also seen uh, new innovators here, Maria and, and uh, A2T, has developed their product internationally. Um, so now we'll see what we have coming up uh, as new corporations, because this project is ending by the end of November. Um, and uh, first of all, are there any questions that you want to clarify with, with those um, those presentations we have had? And if, are there any questions from online participants? No. No? Yeah, a comment. Yeah, a comment. Yeah. Uh, and this is because all of us presenting today have been ratified by everyone. But I don't think Stan ever got. That you in a very humble but strong, strong handed have led us through the project <laughs> over a few years. And uh, looking to some of the personalities, I can say it was not very easy all the time. <laughs> so I think I've done a great job, and I think I speak for all of us. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Stan. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to hear. Thank you. Um, uh, what a, so what? Uh, just would like to mention some things we have in the pipe. Um, I know the Stockholm Environment Institute. You have some ideas on gridless phase two. Yes, I'll be very quick. So gridless, as I mentioned, I think earlier to somebody, it's been the sister project to Swash uh, for financing the project. And uh, we're moving on to phase two, started this year, and we're moving on with the new work, uh, partly inspired by some of the work presented here, and partly new ways. But uh, here we're looking at uh, 
energy for water. So basically, the connection between these two sectors are traditionally are looked at separately. Uh, what are what's coming up? What's happening not just in land but also offshore? Uh, in in this stage, we're moving towards being a little bit more hands-on. For example, work package three is going to be developing tools for island settings. Uh, work package four is going to be looking, reviewing at how uh, the deployment of solar mini grids has worked out and what hasn't worked out. Uh, work package five is looking at uh, urban water utilities in relation to adaptation. How can it uh, ensure an equitable adaptation in the future? Work package two is very much inspired by the work that uh, EcoBarch has been has been running and and uh, feeding on uh, the wave of uh, interest, increasing interest in the marine space for deploying all sorts of activities. We want to look at what are the uh, opportunities there, and then we're we are basically looking at at all of this uh, from a scale and power approach. How are these new types of infrastructures influencing the way? that places are governed, how people take uh, decisions, uh, what types of new power relations are, are, are created from, from new infrastructures. Uh, so if we move on to the next, yeah. the second one is the project that's going to be launched next year called Inoakuga, which is financed by CEDA. We're looking at three uh, aspects here, uh, with particular focus on capacity building and finding actual solutions. In a quite extreme context, I would say is the more ex most extreme of extremes because it's not just the lack of things, but the fact that you can't access it, and the fact that uh, being able to to cover for them or trying to get some finances is basically non-existent. It's a difficult country. So uh, hopefully this project can also act as a catalyst for a lot of people that might be interested in entering this stage, and and that we can facilitate contacts with. Uh, Local actor. That's it. Great. Stan, can I make a comment? There? Yes. From ECOBAR's side, we really appreciate the contact and development in the Swedish Environmental Institute for Cuba. And I can say that the team behind ECOBAR's, we have actually already provided floating power plants in Cuba uh, and are supplying electricity, although fossil fuel. So we look at this as a huge opportunity to collaborate with you and really appreciate your. The event you created this summer that we could participate with the Cuban delegation. It was uh, very appreciated, and we look forward to looking at how this can be developed next year. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, so we haven't talked so much about the Cuba test bed, but the Environment Institute have, has been there and uh, uh, had seminars and workshops and see how how Cuba what could what could work in, in Cuba within the project. So that's, that's an interesting continuation there. And then I would like to say that we also are looking into from from our side uh, to uh, for a big big project um, where we will actually see if we can create a strategic innovation program within resilience in crisis war and peace uh, we we will call it um, uh, to actually strengthen the innovation system for civil contingency in Sweden. Uh, this is also something we are we are working on uh, as a continuation of this project. Um, so um, I don't know if, if are there more things uh, on your side uh, here in the, in the on, on continuation work. Um, we will we will now do a, a final report in Vinova and uh, we'll also look at look at what kind of new corporations there are. So what we have seen is that there are quite a lot of new things coming up uh, to continue mm -hmm. and the website will be there for another year. Um, I don't know Nina if you are part of the Nina from Vinova if you are part of the meeting here still? Yes, yes I've been here all the time. Great. It's just I have a cold so uh, I uh, shut off the camera <laughs> to sneeze in peace. Okay. <laughs> so hi thank you for having me. Uh, as a program manager, there's nothing more rewarding than to be able to follow a project to the end and to be able to attend these sort of seminars. So I'm very disappointed that I couldn't come in person because of this cold. But it's just it's so interesting when it all comes together in the end, the learning the results, the benefits, as we heard, for example, from Echo Barge here and, and all of the other interesting pot projects. 
And uh, this feeling goes double with uh, projects that come from challenge driven innovation, uh, CDA, CDI as we call it, challenge driven innovation, because they represent quite large well investments at Vinova, and we usually also deliver very interesting results correspondingly, just as we heard today. And uh, these projects, uh, CDI projects, were um, supposed to be a high level of complexity, as we've seen. A lot of actors that really have to cooperate together to deliver results, and also we're supposed to uh, contribute to solving challenges related to the global sustainability goals. And for me, you're just one of those projects that really symbolizes the values that we tried to um, install in this program in a very nice way. Uh, there's also this feature with system perspective that we expect uh, work to be carried out in these sort of projects, not in one dimension, but in several. And you see this here, there's so many interesting off-grid innovations um, that you presented today, and maybe there are even more that wasn't presented. So thank you to all presenting companies, but it's not only sort of product process development that's interesting. I mean, business model learnings, for example, the insights regarding the success factors and the global market for off-grain solutions was super interesting. And I think there's a lot of projects, other projects that might benefit from that fine analysis. And we have infrastructure and production systems, for example, I know with um, uh, Water in a Box, you um, mentioned the um, hardships of trying to find producers uh, that could handle your innovation. And then policy and regulation, of course, uh, my special area is actually innovation procurement. So I found the procurement side of this very interesting. And with culture and values, the tree well wastewater system, you explained very nicely how education was a very important success factor for you. So you've been working within all these dimensions, all the five dimensions that we uh, want these projects to work within. And also the end of uh, the end of today was really interesting also to see this sort of cooperation with different analysis and uh, alliances, sorry, and scaling initiatives. So I'm really pleased that you focus so much on that sort of matching things, for example, with Parlalink and, and the scaling things. Um, you would think that this was, would be obvious, but I've seen so many projects that people sort of forget that the projects really need to live on. So you have to be able to scale up. You have to be able to deliver the benefits and if you want to deliver benefits, then you need to create conditions for the innovations to actually be able to deliver. And also, of course, really excited to hear about the SIP plans. I hope that goes well for you. So I just wanted to commend you all on the hard and very important work that you have been performing during these two years and the years before that, of course, and during the pandemic, nevertheless. So thank you for having me and the best luck to you and the project in the future. Thank you. Thank you. This is for you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Nina. And uh, thank you all of you uh, who have participated today. Uh, I think we were uh, 60 uh, registered in the in the beginning uh, for, for the whole um, for the whole session today. So we have had some followers today. Uh, I don't know how many were uh, in, the, in the meeting. But uh, thank you. It's been very interesting to listen to you all. And um, unfortunately, you will not be able to get the drinks and the mingle now, all of you out there in the online. But we will do that. And I, I hope you have provided yourself with some something to uh, to drink now afterwards, at least. <laughs> okay. Then uh, that's off. Thank you so much for today. Thank you. All.